member city council even the session will now come to order for March 24, 2022. Uh, Mr. Uh, Leonard Scalp will give a brief moment of silence, I believe. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we did not have a morning meeting today, so uh, which this is an unusual that we do it for an evening meeting, but uh, if we could just have a moment of silence uh, since we did not have invocation. Thank you very much. I know Mr. Citrill has the Boy Scouts coming, so if they do come, we'll give you a little time. Maybe they can do the Pledge of Allegiance for us, huh? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. There was a mix-up in the time that they were supposed to be here. But if you would give me enough time to, when they do arrive, at least acknowledge them and, and let them have two seconds. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mr. All right, roll call. Carlson? Here. Manny Scacco? Here. Cedro? Here. Vieira? Here. Miranda Here. and Goods. Here. We have a physical quorum. All right, Mr. Shelby. Yes, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Tampa City Council, Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. Uh, today is um, Thursday, March 24th. Uh, it is after 5 o'clock, and uh, we are here at Old City Hall meeting in person. Now, members of the public uh, may participate in this City Council meeting by either attending in person or at, um, by doing so virtually through video teleconferencing referred to by Florida Statutes and Rules as Communication Media Technology. Please be advised that the public and the citizens of Tampa are able to watch, listen, and view this meeting on Spectrum Channel 640, Frontier Channel 15, and on the internet at tampa.gov forward slash live stream. Now, pre-registration is necessary to participate virtually in a public hearing on a quasi-judicial or legislative matter for more information about the ability to do so, including schedules and a link to registration forms and detailed instructions, the uh, website is tampa.gov forward slash quasi, Q-U-A-S-I, quasi, and that link is also available on the City Council's webpage at tampa.gov forward slash city council. Now, a reminder to participants tonight in order to participate via CMT, um, you must have access to a communications media device such as a tablet or a computer with a camera and a microphone that will enable you to be seen by video and heard with audio by the City Council and other participants. For these specific two-way um, video virtual meetings, cell phones and smartphones are not compatible as they will not allow you to share your camera when connected. Now, the uh, the instructions are available, as I said, on the City Council's webpage. And for the purposes of the record, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just uh, move that into the record to be received and filed later. Are you going to do that now? That'll be fine. Mr. Mascal, let's have Mr. Chief, in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. And before we um, uh, go on with tonight's meeting, just a reminder about um, ex parte communications council. If you have had any ex parte communications, um, uh, a verbal or uh, um, text or anything that has not been um, uh, put into the, uh, the quasi box or uploaded for public inspection, uh, please make sure you do so before the hearing starts. Uh, also, if you receive, I am going to ask the public to please avoid communicating with city council members electronically during the meeting, and I'd ask council to avoid looking at those. Um, that would be inappropriate. There is a deadline involved, and that is in the instructions. Also, with regard to the GoToMeeting platform, for those of you in the public who are on the GoToMeeting platform, there is a chat box, but that is not to be used to communicate to City Council about anything relating to the subject of the hearings. It's only to be used if you need it for technical issues. So I ask that you remain mindful of that. Also, I believe, Mr. Chairman, that uh, Mr. Vieira is appearing virtually tonight, so therefore, with regard to um, uh, votes, they would have to be roll call votes to acknowledge uh, his participation. And because we are still using CMT and have uh, yet to update the council's rules, uh, consistent with the rules that I've, I've expressed and uh, putting into the record, I would ask that you waive your standing rules and adopt the rules for CMT tonight. So moved. by Mr. Mariscalco. Second. Second by Mr. Seat. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, I guess we're open for business. Item number one. She already did roll call. Sorry. Right. Mr. Uh, Moran has opened. Second one is the citrus. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. All right, I guess we open for business now.
Ms. Susan Johnson Velez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Susan Johnson Velez, Legal Department. Item number one, uh, council members, is a um, an amendment or first amendment to a development agreement between the City of Tampa and Tampa Bay One LLC. Um, this is the developer of Midtown, and the development agreement um, relates to the Midtown development. So. Um, pursuant to the Midtown Plat, the developer dedicated to the city a permanent, non-exclusive 30-foot drainage easement for stormwater and drainage use. And the developer has requested allowance for a limited encroachment into this drainage easement area for purposes of putting a canopy structure um, for the development. Um, under the Plat, encroachment, encroachments into the drainage easement area are not allowed unless they're allowed in the development agreement, and the development agreement currently does not allow the encroachment that the developer is requesting. And so this First Amendment would allow for that encroachment. Um, we have worked with staff, um, stormwater department staff, and they are, um, they are in agreement with allowing this limited encroachment into um, the drainage easement area. So I'm happy to answer any questions, and the developer's representative, Mark Bentley, is here as well if you have any questions for him. And this is a public hearing um, pursuant to the uh, Development Agreement Act. Any questions, Ms. Velez? Uh, here now, we open the app. Thank you, Susan. My name is Mark Bentley, 401 East Jackson Street, Tampa, 33602. I represent the developer, Tampa Bay One, also known as Midtown. Uh, what they're trying to accomplish are a couple things that weren't contemplated when we zoned the property in 2018 is uh, just for a couple minor encroachments for awnings for a restaurant and for retail to encroach into a drainage easement. Um, under the agreement before you, the city has the ability to request those improvements be removed at any point in time. We're responsible for maintenance. Uh, I can just give you a quick look here. Um, The overhead will come on. There we go. So what we have here, you can see this picture here. It's that kind of a better way to. This is an overhang. This is for Oprah's proposed restaurant. I'll call it. And it's just a little minor area there that's in a drainage easement. And then we have this retail here. You see this overhang here. That's a, technically a drainage easement as well. And you can see how it's supported here just temporarily. So those are removable supports. So that's what the amendment's about. Any questions? And like Susan indicated, all the staffs reviewed it and they concur and they support it. Mr. Wren, you ready now? Pardon me? Yeah, there was. I got a problem. Thank you. Anyone else from Mr. Bentley? All right. Anyone else here to speak on the side? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Schiff? No rights to speakers for this item. Mr. 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 Second. Mr. Mr. Miranda, in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. Mr. Chairman? You recognize? Thank you, sir. Um, with regard to this item, um, there is no action to be taken at this first public hearing. I would ask that the second public hearing be announced by the clerk. Uh, and um, that would be... Um, the second public hearing will be held on April 7th at 9.30 a.m. Of 2022? April of 2022, yes. April, April 7th, 2022 at 9.30 a.m. for the second public hearing. And at that time, Ms. johnson Velez, then there will be an agreement um, for them to take action on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Schiller, do you still have a vote on the items tonight? Or this item or no? You still need to vote on the item, correct? No, sir. Okay. This okay. was okay. Right. statutorily, you conducted okay. your first public hearing. Ms. Johnson Velez, right. if you want to just clarify for the council what just happened. That's correct. Susan Johnson Velez, Legal Department. This is the first of two required um, statutory public hearings, so there is no action needed at this evening. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Item number two. Jennifer Malone with your Planning Commission staff. I'm here to present on item number two, which is a plan amendment, and I will share my screen whenever I have the permission to. So this is um, Plan Amendment TA CPA 21-25. It is a privately initiated amendment. It's small scale at about 7.65 acres. And the request before you tonight is community mixed use 35 to regional mixed use 100. It is located in the central Tampa Community District within the historic Ebor neighborhood and the Central Park Urban Village. 
Here's an aerial of the subject site. It is outlined here in the yellow. Um, the yellow dashed line it represents the Ebor Historic District. So as you can see, it is just outside of that. I have the Encore development to the east of the site um, past North Nebraska Avenue. There's Nuccio Parkway to the south. East 7th Avenue is to the north. And the Channel District is located further south of the subject site. And of course, Ebor is located um, north and northeast of the subject site. Um, this is the Tampa Park property south uh, property, um, Tampa Park apartment south, excuse me. Um, so there's some pictures, these were taken several months ago, so I think things have probably rapidly changed since then, but we're looking south down Maryland Avenue. We're looking east towards the subject site from East Maryland Avenue. This one we're looking west towards the subject site from New Chio Parkway. Looking north towards the subject site from East Scott Drive. Looking northeast towards BT Washington Elementary School from the intersection of East Scott Street and East Scott Drive. And here's the adopted future land use map. So the um, the two the three parcels are community mixed use 35. That's the pink color. I will note that to the north, um, two parcels to the north have been amended to urban mixed use 60, but the map just has not been um, adopted or it has not been. Um, reflected on the future land use map because we do up, up, update those quarterly but tampa park property north um went to the urban mixed use 60 and then this is the three parcels to the south um the green is um a park that was actually recognized under the park project tampa park park i believe um we have some regional mixed use 100 in the area there is some remaining like industrial that's the gray color the dark maroon is the central business district, and then we have urban mixed use 60 north of East A Street. And then the proposed future land use map would recognize these parcels under the regional mixed use 100 future land use designation. As you can see, there's quite a bit of that in the surrounding area already. <clears throat> uh, so this would increase the impact, the, um, the development potential from about 267 units mm -hmm. to 765 units. It would also greatly increase the square footage from 600,000 square feet to about over a million square feet. Um, it would allow for additional density and intensity and would introduce the possibility of additional zoning districts, such as the RM35, the RM50, the RM75, and the commercial intensive zoning district would all be allowed if um, this is approved or would be considered. Um, the Planning Commission found this consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, related to the city design policies and the city, city planning strategy. Um, we, the planning commission found that this was consistent with the fact that the comprehensive plan recognizes the city's population will continue to grow and housing opportunities should be created um, to meet the present the needs of its present and future population. There's also a policy in the plan that directs the greatest share of growth to go towards us urban villages and this is located in an urban village. Um, this will um, also, there's parcels designated RME 100 to the east, approximately 400, um, yes, and I, I apologize, to the east, about 400 feet away from the subject site. So we found that it would be compatible with the underlying, with, with the surrounding future land use designations. Um, so we found that that would provide continuity between those existing RME 100 designated parcels and would continue to provide sensitivity to the areas of lower intensity land uses. Um, one last thing, since it is on the periphery of the Ebor Local Historic District, any proposed development on site um, would need to ensure that it does not adversely affect the integrity of the historic resources by creating an appropriate transition that is integrated, compatible, and in character with the surrounding area. That concludes my presentation. Again, the Planning Commission voted that this is consistent. City staff is on the line. I know Frank Hall is here if you have any questions for city staff, but they had no objections to this as well. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Any questions, Ms. Malone? All right. All right. Let's go hear from the applicant. Good evening, gentlemen. My name is Tyler Hudson, and my address is 400 North Ashley Drive. It's wonderful to be back in the stream again. It's it's been quite a while. Um, I do have a brief presentation I'd like to give. If someone can help me.
Can you all see the screen? You have it, sir. Wonderful. So just to orient and go a little bit uh, on top of what Jennifer just said, the area that you see that's shaded in blue is the Gas Works Project, which I think Council is, is familiar with. The yellow dotted line is the historic district. What I, what I want to make clear about this specific application that's before you this evening is that it's really a continuation of what was originally one application that got split into two for reasons that I'll, I'll go into in a second. You'll see an area on the top that says TACPA 21-20. That's uh, That was approved by uh, this council in uh, January. Originally, we had this as an, it was one entire application. This council may recall that there was something called the private property rights element that uh, under state law you had to adopt into the Tampa Comprehensive Plan. Uh, that created some timing issues for a lot of amendments and for reasons that I will spare this council's, uh, spare you and certainly my fellow travelers on tonight's agenda, we had to break the amendment into two different applications. So the northern portion was approved uh, in January. Tonight we're talking about the portions that are next to the green arrows labeled one, two, and three. I think Jennifer really hit the key bases. You can see that there, there already is RMU 100 to the east, to the southeast, as well as to the west of the site. Uh, the staff uh, recommended uh, consistency finding unanimously on Valentine's Day of this year. The Planning Commission recommended consistency. This is the most important slide that I, I have to show, and, and this is from 2006. This is the CRA plan that the, the your predecessors sitting as the CRA adopted for Central Park, and it shows uh, this precise site as, as being, as recommending RMU 100 future land use from a density perspective. And, and I'm not sure 16 years ago, the uh, your predecessors on, on the CRA would have definitely thought about the growth that the city would, would experience, but we believe this is an appropriate densification for these parcels. Um, the, your, your expert staff agrees, the Planning Commission agrees, and all of this density that you see in the comprehensive plan for this area will, will get implemented by zoning, as Council is well aware. Specifically, this site um, is the subject of a pending rezoning, uh, 21114, which will come to you in the near future. It is filed. It's a PDA for gas works uh, that I've, I've mentioned to you before. So that's where the details will get fleshed out, and we'll talk to you about what we're going to do with this density. But tonight, we're asking uh, you to approve, essentially, this continuation of a, another application uh, for this appropriate amount of density in the urban core, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks for your time. Any questions for the gentleman? You recognize? Go ahead, Mr. Carlson. Um, Ms. Malone talked about the transition related to ARC. The ARC doesn't have jurisdiction directly, but there's some kind of requirement for transition. And if somebody, if Kate says that's not applicable, let me know. But since she mentioned it, um, can you just explain that? Sure. It's, it's certainly applicable. So under the comprehensive plan, under state law, land development regulations, including zonings, need to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. And so while the land that we're talking about tonight isn't in the Ybor City Historic District. The comprehensive plan is, is really replete with provisions that you still need to be sensitive on the periphery of historic districts. And that's really exactly what, what um, a potential rezoning of this site would need to show, I think, in order to get this council support. So just because it's not in the historic district doesn't mean we don't need to be mindful of that, especially where it, where it abuts. And as you can see, the blue line, th there is an area where you will have high density entitlement next to a historic district. And it will be on us as, or it will be on an applicant in a rezoning for this land to show you that it's been appropriately tailored. Thank you. And going somewhere in similar to that vein, uh, in, in, in comparison to Encore, which is right down the street, which is also in another CRA, would this be consistent with the amount of residences that are allowed in Encore, that have been allowed in Encore? Um, I'm not sure if Jennifer would want to, in, in my view, yes, it would be. All of the channel district is RMU 100. Um, and I believe this would be entirely consistent with Encore, most of which is RMU 100. This is in the same CRA uh, as Encore Central Park. So it's really just extending it over. Two, from one, just, I was just trying to get a little comparison. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anyone else? Mr. Uh, All right. Seeing none, anyone else to speak on this side? Race to speak on this out Yes, we had Jean Strohmeyer, but she's not logged on. Second. Okay. Right, 
Now it's got the move closed. This is round of second on the favor. Aye. Right. And closed. Which is granted. Right. Mr. Carlson, we take number two at the gate. I'd like to move uh, file number TA CPA 2125 ordinance being presented for first reading consideration ordinance amending the Imagine 2040 Tampa Comprehensive Plan future land use element, future land use map for the property located at 1502 Nutrio Parkway to, uh, sorry, 920 Gamalan Court and 1314 Nutrio Parkway from community mixed use 35 CMU 35 to regional mixed use 100 RMU 100 providing for appeal of all ordinance ordinances and conflict providing for severability providing effective days. Say by Mr. Maniscalco, roll call. And just, and just, to, just yeah. to add that the um, planning commission found it consistent. All right, roll call. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Cedro? Yes. And Goose? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on April 21st, 2022 at 9.30 a.m. All right. Can somebody tell me what Gamal Gamalan is? I've never heard that name before. Guido, you must know what it is. It, it may be one of the courts that's up in Tampa Park. Is that the name of somebody? Park. It's just right. a small little street. Is that the name of somebody? Do you know? Uh, that I can't ask. Right. Nusio. We got all these historians here. Nusio. Nobody. Knows. But mostly the names that are, at, are in the old Tampa Park Plaza area are named after somebody. Yeah. yeah. So probably. I just if anybody watching has it, please email us. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Item number three. Jennifer Malone again. Item number three is plan amendment on TACPA 21-28, located on Cluster Avenue. This is in the Central Tampa Planning District in the Seminole Heights Urban Village in the Old Seminole Heights neighborhood. Um, here it is outlined in blue this time. It is just east of North Florida Avenue. Bo's Ice Cream Shop is located just to the south of the subject site. We also have a self-storage facility to the north along North Florida Avenue as well as a variety of uses, commercial uses, some car um, Ms. Malone, dealerships. Just one second. Ms. Malone, oh. our CTTV, our monitors are not working up on this. All right, here we go. You may continue. Okay. <clears throat> so um, as we can see, the subject site is outlined in blue, just east of North Florida Avenue. Um, I'll give you a moment to take in the aerial, but there's a, a self-storage facility, some, some car dealerships, and the American Legion Park in the area as well. And then along um, East Cluster, which is where the subject site is located, is a lot of single family detached. It is a small scale amendment, privately initiated, about 0.35 acres from residential 10 to residential 20. Um, this is one of the subject sites, uh, the subject site, but one of the, it's two parcels. This is 203 East Cluster Avenue. This is 201 East Cluster Avenue. Um, this is a single family home, just to give you an idea of what is along East Cluster Avenue. And then this is facing East. So North Florida was behind me when I took this picture. And then this is one block to the North of the site, just to kind of be an idea of East Hamilton Avenue facing West um, and those commercial uses that are very close up along um, North Florida Avenue. Um, so this is the adopted future land use map. As you can see, the subject site is residential 10. There's also community commercial 35 along North Florida Avenue. That's the red color. To the south is the American Legion Park in the green. Um, there's also some property owned um, by some nonprofits in the American Legion and the in the blue. That's public semi-public. Um, further south along East Sly is community mixed use 35. That's the pink color that allows that allow those commercial uses as well. Um, residential 20 is also within the surrounding area, um, which is what the applicant is requesting on the proposed future land use map. Um, so this would give a small increase in density. It would go from three dwelling units to seven dwelling units that can be considered. It would also increase the amount of non-residential square feet from about 5,000 to 7,000. Um, the subject site would still be required to meet locational criteria for the consideration of non-residential uses. Um, so that is it's still a requirement in the comprehensive plan within the proposed uh, residential 20 future land use designation. Um, so the planning commission did find this consistent with the comprehensive plan. The Seminole Heights plan seeks to ensure the sensitive transition of uses from the core commercial areas into the surrounding stable neighborhoods. So we did find that, or the planning commission did find that 
um, since it's very intense along North Florida Avenue, this would be a sensitive step down um, from those uses along North Florida Avenue. As you all know, the Seminole Heights urban um, village, um, there was a planning effort in 2009, the Greater Seminole Heights Vision Plan. And so um, that is kind of where some of this language comes from as well. And we're supposed to look at that vision plan for plan amendments and zonings in the Seminole Heights area. Um, there's also the provision, again, to direct the British growth to urban villages to meet the need for Tampa's growing population. Um, there's also a provision in the plan called the Seminole Heights Node Bonus that would allow for compatible infill development and redevelopment to support transit and services in Seminole Heights. That came out of that 2009 Seminole Heights Vision Plan. So the Planning Commission did find that this would, um, it, the, the Node Bonus allows a 25% increase above the adopted future land use and that, that you know this would help um this would in, would promote the utilization of that and in this area you know can, is 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 in a, in a great opportunity for those increased housing opportunities is in a great uh situation so again the planning commission did find it consistent and i'm available for any questions and the city staff is here but they have no objections to this as well any question miss malone joined Anyone else we'll speak on this item? Anyone we'll raise to speak on this item? No, we to speakers for this item. Okay. Okay. Mr. Scaffold, say one, Mr. Citro. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. Mr. Scaffold. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I have an ordinance being presented for first reading consideration. An ordinance amending the imagined 2040 Tampa Comprehensive Plan Future Land Use Element. Future future land use map for the property located at 201 and 203 East Cluster Avenue from residential 10 R10 to residential 20 R10, providing for a repeal of all ordinances in conflict, providing for a severability, providing an effective date. Uh, there was consistency all across the board. Uh, and that's my motion. Second. 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 Roll call. Carlson? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Cedro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. And Goose? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on April 21st, 2022 at 9.30 a.m. All right. Item number four. Jennifer Malone again with your planning commission. Item number four is TACPA 21-30 located along Maple Avenue and Oakwood Avenue. This is in the Central Tampa Planning District, but this time we're on Palmetto Beach. It is also located within the Crystal High Hazard area. Here's an aerial of the subject site. It is um, east of South 20th Street. Uh, it's uh, several parcels located at the corner of, well, just um, a little bit away from the corner of South 22nd and Maple and Oakwood. Um, so there's two parcels on Maple and one on Oakwood. Um, the South 22nd Street is really characterized by a lot of commercial uses. Um, but these internal local streets have a lot of residential uses on them. And then of course, we all know that there's industrial um, along South 20th Street. And then we have the bay to the east. This is a small scale amendment. It's, a part, it's approximately 0.53 acres. And the request for you tonight is from Transitional Use 24 to Community Mixed Use 35. Here's the subject site along Oakwood Avenue facing north. Here's the intersection of Maple Avenue and uh, South 22nd Street. Here's Maple Avenue facing east. So the subject site was on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, this is just a characteristic, uh, just a standard picture of the type of development that's along Maple Avenue and the adopted future land use map. So as we can see, there's community mixed use 35. That's the pink color along South 22nd Street that allows for um, commercial uses and it promotes a mixed use development pattern. Um, the, the salmon color is transitional use 24. That plan category goes back to um, the time before planning and zoning essentially, and it allows for a lot of different uses, it allows for some industrial uses and residential uses. So you can see in Palmetto Beach, a lot of this area has been developed with a single family detached. That is an allowable use under the transitional use 24. And then the light gray and the dark gray are heavy industrial and light industrial. The proposed um, future land use map shows these three parcels as community mixed use 35 
And as we can see, there's already that uh, future land use category present in the surrounding area. This would increase the potential of dwelling units from 12 to 18, and it would increase the amount of non-residential square footage from about 34,000 to 46,000. So overall, it would allow for additional dwelling units and greater intensity of non-residential. The plan amendment would remove the ability to develop the site with industrial general zoned uses. So that is something that is allowed under the transitional use 24 that is not allowed under the requested community mixed use 35. The Planning Commission voted to find this consistent with the comprehensive plan, and the policies I have listed on the screen are what they cited in their consistency finding that can be found in the resolution. Um, so they found that the plan supports the transformation of major corridors to include a broader mix of uses, and that Palmetto Beach could really um, benefit from this increase of density and intensity to allow for that mixed use development pattern in this area. Um, and the transportation improvements that would support walking and the use of public transportation. So again, the Planning Commission voted to find this consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, city staff is here, but they had no objection, and I'm available for any questions. Any questions, Mr. Lowe? All right, we'll hear from the applicant. Good evening, gentlemen. Tyler Hudson, 400 North Ashley Drive. I'm the applicant, uh, representing the applicant for this particular map amendment. I uh, just briefly want to touch on a couple items that Jennifer noted. We're fairly familiar now with where it is. Um, this, there is a deindustrialization element to this, right? That in transitional use 24, that, that's a category that, as Jennifer alluded to, is used for properties that you proceed a planning or zoning status. And it's a, it's a if you could, uh, visualize TU24, I think it would probably look like a question mark. It's just kind of unclear what the development direction of some of these parcels might be. In certain parts of the city, the, the development direction is, is materializing. So the difference between TU24 and CME35, I think Jennifer alluded to one of the important parts, is that this would no longer allow industrial general uses in this residential emerging mixed-use neighborhood. The density is a, a modest, like 25% increase from 24 units an acre to 30 units. The intensity, though, in, in terms of what's by right, you, you can, you, you know, that folks can come pay for bonus density, but what you get by right, this is actually a decrease. Right now, you get for free a 1.5 FAR. Uh, this would go down to a 1.0. There are opportunities to buy that up um, through, again, the bonus process that council is familiar with, but. Um, from an intensity FAR standpoint, it, it is a, a reduction in what's by right. Um, but note, as Jennifer alluded to, the Planning Commission um, found this consistent. Um, th this is under common ownership, and we're working with the, the neighborhood on, on what eventually the rezoning for this is going to look like to knit all of this together. Uh, but again, we're only today talking about the, the change to the future land use that will shape that eventual rezoning. Um, Jennifer called it salmon. I guess that's the, the, the red color. This TU24 isn't mentioned a lot in the comprehensive plan, but where it is mentioned, it's not, it's not mentioned particularly favorably. I've, I've underlined, you can see on screen, that the, it, it says the long-term strategy of the city is to reduce the number of parcels designated as TU24. And, and that's probably not going to come from just some broad city action where, they just, where the city just initiates this on their own. It's going to come from uh, property owners, you see a uh, better direction, a more def defined direction for what their neighborhood wants to be like, and that's, I think, really exactly what you have here, going from TU24 to, I think, what our staff would probably agree is really the, the next incremental step up, which would, would be a CMU35 designation. The comprehensive plan addresses the South Tampa Planning District, the Central Tampa Planning District, the other planning districts of the city. Central Tampa comprises what we think of as the urban core and those peripheral neighborhoods which Palmetto Beach might be a little bit of a stretch to call it a urban periphery, but it is awfully close to a lot of emerging kind of higher density parts of the city. And those comprehensive plan provisions are, are on screen for your benefit, talking about higher density housing, the development of mixed use buildings. You know, again, I, I think while a mixture of uses could include industrial, I don't think anyone would think those are industrials particularly compatible in a mixed use environment. So by approving this, we would we'd get away from that. Uh, 22nd Street, That's this is the Ikea, right? So you take the Ikea and go further down. It is predominantly residential. Um, now there, there are going to be opportunities at certain intersections for the development of, of mixtures of uses. Um, 
to, to create sort of the 15 minute city where if you live in Palmetto Beach, you can, you can walk to get sundries, things like that. The CMU 35 is gonna be more accommodating to that type of mix of use than, than the TU 24 would be. Um, again, the, the, when you talk about the Central Tampa Planning District, there's an expectation of, of moderate density multifamily zones. I think CMU 35 is, is definitely a low to moderate density category. And that's alluded to, this isn't next to downtown, and, and that, that would not be an accurate Mr. way to Hudson, say it. Mo most of your industrial, if I can recall, of Palmetto Beach area is to the southwest, isn't it? Yes, sir, and to the west directly. It's really the west okay. and, and the south. This is getting towards the bottom of the residential cluster. I don't say the cluster. Where the kind T of, is. You can see the, the line. Is? What's that, sir? It's where the T is? You're talking about the little Correct. line where the T is? Okay. Yeah, we're the, we're where the... Um, the, the star is, which so we're, we're fairly far east. We're really only about a block off the water to the west. Um, and that's, that's really all I have. I appreciate your time. I'm happy to answer any questions that, that you all might have. Any questions, Mr. Hudson? Anyone speak on the side? Anyone race to speak on the side? No race to speak for this item. We close? Second. Scott, for some of my seats. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. All right, Ms. Citra, number four, if you mind, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Ordinance being presented for first reading and consideration. An ordinance amending the imagined 2040 Tampa Comprehensive Plan, future land use element, future land use map of the property located at 2015 and 2017 Maple Avenue and 2020 Oakwood Avenue from transitional use 24 TU 24 to community mixed use 35 M, excuse me, CMU 35, providing for appeal of all ordinances in conflict, providing for severability, providing an effective date, as the Planning Commission has found this amendment consistent. Second. Mr. Mayor Scott. Roll call. Carlson. Yes. Manny Scacco. Yes. Vieira. Yes. Citro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. And Goose? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on April 21st, 2022 at 9.30 a.m. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Madam Clerk, did Mr. Miranda open 1 through 40 or 1 through 9? 1 through 4. I'll open now, Mr. Chairman, uh, 5 through 9. Second. Second by Mr. Uh, Mascal. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. Item number 5. Thank you so much. This is Andy Hussain, Development Coordination. Can yeah. I please be sworn in with the rest of my staff? Yep. Madam Clerk's going to swear everyone in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Mr. Chairman, members of council, Kate Wells for the Who's record. No, no. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. yes. Thank you. All My right. apologies. You got to do our thing, you know? Absolutely. I forget about the virtual component. All right. Thank you. I'm here on item number five. For the record, I'm Kate Wells, Chief Assistant City Attorney. With me this evening is Toyin Ina Hargret, Senior Assistant City Attorney in the Litigation Practice Group. This item is before Council based upon the Special Magistrate's report and recommendation from a request for relief filed by Woodfield Acquisitions LLC pursuant to Section 70.51 of the Florida Statutes, also known as the Florida Land Use and Environmental Dispute Resolution Act. I want to make a few brief comments before providing the history of this application and the details of the proposed settlement. Unlike the standard rezoning application scheduled for your consideration this evening, any time City Council considers a settlement proposal, your role is legislative and allows Council to consider items outside of the City's Land Development Code and the Comprehensive Plan, including but not limited to the impact and public interest resulting from the proposed settlement. After I conclude my presentation, you will hear from Scott Steady, who is retained by the city and Woodfield to be the special magistrate. Once Mr. Steady makes his presentation on the mediation process that we followed and explains his recommendation, you will hear from city staff, planning commission staff, the applicant, the public, 
and I recommend that you conclude the hearing once you provide the applicant with an opportunity for rebuttal. And finally, as you consider the testimony and evidence entered into the record of tonight's hearing, please remember that although the special magistrate's report and recommendation is a public record, actions and statements of representatives for the city and for Woodfield are evidence of an offer of compromise and inadmissible in any proceeding. I mention this in the event you are concerned that the possibility of establishing precedent if you adopt and accept the special magistrate's recommendation. At your January 21st, 2021 meeting, 14 months ago, City Council denied the rezoning from IH, Industrial Heavy, to PD, Plan Development, which would have allowed the development of a multifamily project containing 299 dwelling units and 5,000 square feet of retail space within a four-story building. City Council's motion to deny focused on a few areas, including incompatibility of the proposed intensity of development and failure to comply with the Comprehensive Plan Land Use Policy 8.11.5, which provides in part a proposed plan development rezoning which abuts existing heavy industrial uses that are hazardous to the public health and safety must demonstrate through design and accepted practices that the occupants of the new use shall not be unduly at risk from such hazards. On February 19, 2021, Woodfield filed a request for relief pursuant to 7051 and a separate three count complaint in circuit court, which includes a petition for writ of certiorari and a complaint for damages pursuant to 42 USC section 1983 which alleges that council's decision violated Woodfield's constitutional guarantee of equal protection. Ms. Ina Hargrid is available to answer any questions you may have regarding the litigation, which by the way is stayed pending the outcome of this proceeding. Now turning your attention back to the procedural history of this application. When the request for relief was originally filed with the city, my office provided council with a memorandum describing the administrative proceeding under 7051, it involves a two-step process, the first of which requires the special magistrate to conduct an informal mediation during which the city and Woodfield consider alternative developments responsive to council's decision of denial on the application. In this case, the special magistrate conducted four separate mediations between May and October of 2021. During the final mediation, Woodfield presented two alternative site plans intended to address the basis for council's denial. Comments were received from those members of the public who elected to participate and from city representatives. At the conclusion of the fourth mediation, the city, Woodfield, and the special magistrate felt that progress had been made and we agreed to cooperate in finalizing the site plans that are before you this evening. The special magistrate by order issued on December 2nd, 2021 recommends that city council accept this proposal and the alternative site plans went through DRC review on December 15th. So tonight's hearing is part of the first step of the administrative process and requires city council to consider the alternative site plans as a proposed settlement. If city council rejects the mediated resolution, the second step in the administrative process will commence and the special magistrate will hold a hearing to consider the facts and circumstances set forth in the request for relief to determine whether city council's action in January of last year was unreasonable or unfairly burdens the property. The project before you is different from what was denied a year ago. As I mentioned, the previous site plan requested approval for 299 units which amounts to a density of approximately 35 dwelling units to the acre. The alternative site plans for your consideration are based upon whether Chemical Formulators relocates its business from the current location at 5215 West Tyson Avenue. The first site plan, premised upon CFI remaining in its current location, proposes to mitigate the impacts presented by CFI as required by Land Use Policy 8.11.5. During the mediation, city representatives made it clear to the applicant that the city's willingness to present and support the proposed settlement should not be interpreted as evidence of compliance with this policy, 
This is the applicant's burden and one they must establish during tonight's hearing. The second site plan shows the proposed plan of development if CFI terminates its operations. You will hear from staff and the applicant who will provide many more details on the proposed site plans than I'm gonna give you at this moment. Just generally, they have reduced the number of dwelling units from 299 to 226 at a density of 27 dwelling units to the acre. This density is comparable to other projects this city council has approved on Rattlesnake Point. The site plans also show the parking garages being enclosed modified to reflect the lower density and operates as a buffer between the proposed residential development on the Woodfield parcel and chemical <coughs> formulators to the south. The residential units have been moved away from the southeast property boundary and the applicant has voluntarily uh, offered a payment of $174,000 to be applied to improvements to Tyson Avenue. This is in addition to the proportionate share mitigation for the design and construction of a new traffic signal at Tyson and West Shore, as well as the mitigation payment for improvements in the Inner Bay District. As I mentioned, this payment is voluntary and not required by the Land Development Code. If approved, the site plans and the ordinance approving the rezoning expressly provide that City Council retains exclusive authority to amend or modify the site plans. Any code provision that would otherwise allow staff to make any minor amendments administratively will not apply here. Only this city council can amend the site plans if they're approved this evening. In a regular rezoning or quasi-judicial hearing, city council looks solely to whether the applicant has demonstrated by substantial competent evidence that the project meets the city's land development code regulations and the comprehensive plan. But because this is a settlement proposal, there are other factors that City Council must take into consideration, including the fact that if the settlement proposal is approved, the lawsuit filed in Circuit Court will be dismissed with prejudice, and each party will bear their own attorney's fees and costs. So your options this evening are set out under Section 7051, Subsection 21. The first is to accept the special magistrate's report and recommendation and to proceed to implement the recommendation. In this case, implementation of the recommendation would require council to adopt a motion approving the development proposal and placing the ordinance on first reading. On the other hand, if city council determines that Woodfield has failed to meet its burden and after taking into consideration other relevant matters in the pending litigation, City Council may reject the Special Magistrate's report and recommendation. And finally, City Council may modify the recommendation and implement this subject to Woodfield's consent to the modification. So unless you have any questions for me or Ms. Ina Hargrit, I will turn it over to Mr. Steady. Ms. Wells, I listened to two parts of that. The first part, you gave two scenarios, and in the end, you gave two. If this Council denies th this, this settlement, it now goes back to the magistrate again. Is that correct? I'm hearing it goes back. I, I, we've already had a, a mutual agreement, per se. And if we don't agree, it goes back to the magistrate, and the magistrate brings a final decision, a reference to council decision? The special magistrate would hold a second hearing during which testimony would be taken, and the special magistrate would have to determine whether council's denial in January of last year constitutes an unfair burden um, on the property. That is just a recommendation which would come back to council. That decision is not final. It's subject to council's approval. Thank you. Any Are other you questions? Questions for Ms. Uh, Wells. All right. Thank you. I again. appreciate your time. All right. Good evening, Mr. One, Chairman. One second, I'm, sir. One second. I, Mr. Citra, I see your Boy Scout troop here. I think this might be a little long. You want to get them in right quick, sir? Or would you yeah, I, I was going to point them out to you because okay. I, I, I think you. I'm going to be upstaged. With, with your permission, and if I may quickly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there was a mix-up on timing in which I wanted these uh, fine young scouts to be announced. And with your permission, I would like them to be uh, entered into the uh, chambers and be recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council. Yeah, go ahead. I asked him that.
gentlemen, thank you very, very much. This is Martin Hernandez, and he will be telling us, come on in, gentlemen. Thank you. He will be giving us the troop number and name. Mr. Hernandez, please and thank you. Thank you. Uh, Martin Hernandez with Scouting Troop 53 from South Tampa. Come on in, boys. If, uh, each one can just quickly just say what's your name, what school you go to. And how old you to, are and how, how long you've you been in scouting. Um, I'm Kane Vera. Um, I'm 11. I go to Mitchell Elementary, and I've been in scouting since first grade. Come on, Luke. Uh, my name is Luke Oliver. I go to I am 12 years old and I go to Franklin Boys Middle Magnet Preparatory Academy and I've been in scouting since first grade. Got a lot of awards in this boy. I'm Blair Keats. Uh, Keats. Uh, I'm 15. I go to Robinson High School and I've been scouting for our uh, Boy Scouts for 5 years. I'm uh, Lucas Marset. I've been in scouting since first grade. And what is my and I'm 11, and, and I go to Mitchell Elementary. And I, first grade, this first grade. How many grades? Five grades? Yeah. Five years. Five years. My name is Javier Keats. I'm 14. I go to Madison Middle School, and I've been in scouting for 14, four years, actually. Yeah. Four years. Um, my name is Sawyer Jackson. I'm 13, and I've been in scouting for four years, and I go to Coleman Middle School. My name is Ben Blunt. Uh, I'm 14. I've been in scouting for two years, and I go to Tampa Prep. I'm Scott. I'm 16. I go to Pepin Academies, and I've been scouting for five years. My name is Halsey Keats. I go to Robinson High School. I'm 15, and I've been in scouting for five years. Uh, my name is Jacob Hernandez. I go to Jesuit High School. I'm 15 years old, and I've been in scouting for five years. My name is Lucas Hernandez. I've been in scouting for three years. I'm 14 years old, and I go to Coleman Middle School. My name is Peter Rose. I go to Coleman Middle School. I'm 14. I've been in scouting for four years. Uh, my name is uh, Reed Jackson. Um, I've been in scouting for four years, and I go to uh, I'm 14, and I go to um, Plant High School. My name is Jack Prose. I'm 11. I've been in scouting for four years, and I go to Mitchell Elementary. My name is Alexander Messia. I go to Mitchell Elementary. I've, I'm 11 years old and I've um, been in scouting for three years. We have, yeah. we have parents out there? The parents are out there. We have one more scout that got stuck in some rain. Huh? Come on in, buddy. Come, no, come over here. Why don't you say your name? Your full name and your age. L loud, they can't hear you. Foley Burns and I'm 11. Uh, how long have you been in scouts? I've just joined a few months ago. And what school do you go to? Academy of Holy Names. Good job. Young Scout, can you stay right there at the podium? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if we could please rise and let this Scout join, uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah, I'm going to say the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. Then I'll, let's grab the uniform and salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now, Mr. Chair, with your permission, if we have enough seats, maybe these young scouts can join us for a few minutes to see how their local government works. I want the boy to pick up the last one. Is that all right with you, Mr. Chair? Thank we have, you. We have the parents and the, uh, the scout master here? Yes, sir. This is uh, Rich Jackson, retired colonel, uh, as our scout master. Nice to meet you all. And uh, some other scout leaders outside. Uh, former Scoutmaster, Commander Halsey Keats, and a bunch of other parents are out there. You guys can come in, they don't bite. Thank all you all. They had to get here somehow. Yes. Mr. Hernandez, thank you for bringing these fine young men down here. Thank you. And it was our pleasure to have them in, and I'm, I'm glad they're here to see how their local government works.
Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Thank Chair. You. Audience, thank you very much. Mr. Citro, since you have the young people here, why don't you explain what we're doing right now so we kind of get a gist of what, what the procedures are. Sure. So we're just like, what are we doing? Huh? Well, <laughs> Scouts, we, we are here to discuss land use changes within our community. And we are going to hear from many different sides. The city, the planning for Hillsborough County, the corporations and or companies that want to change this land use, and more especially, we are going to hear from the community and the citizens. And hopefully, after hearing everything that is discussed, remember, dialogue solves everything, we will then make the decision on that land use or proposed land use, land use change. So sit back, listen carefully, and see how our how your local government works. Mr. Chair, was that good enough for you? Thank you, sir. Thank you. There's, there's no need to have the young people here if they don't know the process. See, when you know the process, you learn, and we learn every day by seeing you do it. I like to make sure our young people know what we're doing at all times so they can understand the process going forward. So, Mr. Magistrate, if you want to begin, sir. Yes, thank you. Chairman, member of City Council, Scott Steady. Burn Forum and Suite 3200, One Tampa City Center. That is a tough act to follow, so <laughs> we'll start. So uh, Kate actually went through a lot of things, and I just want to make a few comments. Uh, one is that we did have four mediation sessions. I've been doing this a number of years. That's, uh, we usually have two, maybe three. Both sides really worked real hard uh, to try to come up with these two alternatives. And uh, I think you have some a good decision tonight, but uh, there's a lot of effort put into this. I think one of the most helpful things that occurred was at our first mediation session, Woodfield brought in an expert that you're going to hear later that really explained the CFI operation next door. Uh, I don't think that really came across necessarily at the first hearing that you heard, but they talked about the operations, um, the risk involved with those operations, the likelihood of those risks, and then what happens if those chemicals enter the environment. And with that testimony, it really allowed the staff to really consider those issues, to come up with the, media, the mitigation efforts, the mitigation, excuse me, conditions that are in the alternative one, assuming that CFI stays with the location. So I think that really helped make, a, uh, make this work and have this come back to you. But as Kate said, that expert's gonna testify tonight and you need to consider his testimony and whether you think that they've presented and dealt with the risk involved with the CFI ne uh, next door. So with that, uh, Kate went through, there's other provisions, other compromises that were made, uh, 299 units, basically 25% reduction to the 226. There was the uh, 5,000 square foot of commercial that was discussed at the hearing that, with the denial. But since then, I believe the uh, commercial uses have expanded so that it would provide for the possibility of a better mixed-use project. Uh, we talked a little bit, too, about the extra contribution towards the improvement of Tyson, that 174,000. I was involved in another mediation on Tyson, and that, that was uh, similar to the contribution that's not required by code. It's an over and above the code requirement. Uh, also, there's a provision there that they will provide their proportionate share contribution towards the future light that will go at Tyson and West Shore. Uh, that would be required to be paid at uh, building permits, which is sooner than uh, normal. Uh, the public participated during the process, during the four mediations. I believe there's some of the individuals here tonight. I'm sure they want to comment about it. Um, and with that, uh, I've made the recommendation for your consideration of both alternatives. And uh, you're going to hear from staff as well as the developer. Do you have any questions? I have one. When you talk about the expert, they had an expert last time, if my understanding is still be correct. Uh, I don't believe the expert that spoke for Woodfield was present at that. No. No. So tonight you're going to hear the expert that, was, that spoke at the first mediation that really talked about the chemicals, the risks involved, and how they, uh, when they enter the environment, you know, how they react to the environment. and. Uh, barriers that can be put up, like the uh, parking garage to prevent uh, 
intrusion into the project. So that's going to be new testimony. All right. We're going to hear about that. Yes. Uh, any other council members have uh, any questions for the gentleman? No, additional. All right. Thank you, you very much. Said, we'll begin. We have the applicant. Okay. Please step up. Please step. Please step. Zane, is that going to be you tonight? Yes, sir. How are you doing? All right. We're Good ready, evening. Sir. Good evening, Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. Uh, first, I want to salute and uh, applaud the Boy Scouts. I uh, was a Boy Scout in my younger years, and it was a fantastic experience. On to the agenda. Agenda number five, case REZ 20 66, is for the redesigned project at 5301 West Tyson Avenue. I'm now passing along to Jennifer Malone of the Planning Commission. Good evening, Council. Jennifer Malone again with the Planning Commission. Um, I will be brief, but I'll just provide some high points um, on this case. It's located in South Tampa. Here's an aerial of the subject site along West Tyson Avenue. And here's the future land use. So the future land use is community mixed use 35. There is a language in the comprehensive plan specific to anything located on Rattlesnake Point and anything that has a community mixed use 35 future land use designation. Staff has taken those policies um, and we've outlined them in the staff report and compared what the, what the comprehensive plan is asking for from developments and looked at those policies in relation to the site plan. And we did find that it was consistent. Um, we found that the applicant that with the redesigned site is meeting the policy direction of land use policy 8.11.5. Um, there are several components to this policy, but we found that um, the proposed PD, the orientation of the parking garage, is in compliance with this policy, is providing a buffer between the residences and the um, heavy industrial future land use to the south and the east of the subject site. Um, the applicant is providing the public access to the waterfront. That is required by the comprehensive plan on Rattlesnake Point. And we found that it's addressing the coastal high hazard area by committing to coordinate any hurricane mitigation payments with Hillsborough County. Um, and again, I, I won't belabor this, you've already heard from, from legal, but uh, the Planning Commission did find it consistent and that full analysis and, and how we came to that, con that con finding is in the staff report. So that concludes my presentation and I'm, I'm available for questions. Anything from Ms. Malone? All right, Zane? Thanks so much. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. I'll oh, please, I'll share my screen. Case REZ 20-66, the applicant is Ryan Studzinski. The representative is Ann Pollock for the property address at 5301 West Tyson Avenue. This is proposed rezoning from IH Industrial Heavy to PD Plan Development, Residential Multifamily, Retail Sales, Specialty Goods, Convenience Goods, Shoppers Goods, and Marina. Now, um, on this um, resubmittal, the applicant is uh, proposing two alternative plans. You have a waiver for each alternative plans, as I'll read below. The alternative waiver number one is requesting to reduce the required 15 uh, foot setback, or foot, foot, but, well, the 15 foot landscape buffer on the west side to a 10 foot landscape buffer and allow a 10 foot CMU or precast wall generally along the south property line, uh, also shown on the site plan. The landscape buffer would include a six foot CMU or precast wall along the west and east property lines. The applicant has been requested to make these, uh, this waiver um, worded the certain way between first and second reading if approved. Alternative plan number two, to reduce the required 15 foot landscape buffer on the west side to a 10 foot landscape buffer. The landscape buffer would include a six foot CMU or precast wall along the west and east property lines. The applicant has also been requested to reword the waiver uh, just like uh, like this between first and second reading, if approved. I'll now go to the aerial of the subject site. As you see, the subject site outlined here in red. To the south, you have Tyson. To the north, you have West Gandy Boulevard. Uh, to the west, you have uh, Salt Shack, the restaurant. To the southwest, you have a um, rezoning that was approved. And this was approved for 680 units. To the east, you have a 
uh, rezoning approved for residential multifamily for 325 units. Now, let me give you a first a brief summary and the history of this application. On January 21st, 2021, City Council denied the rezoning application for the property located at 5301 West Tyson Avenue, outlined here in red. The application requested a rezoning from Industrial Heavy, IH, to Plan Development, PD, seeking the approval of a mixed-use project that included 299 dwelling units at 35.7 units per acre and 1,000 square feet of specialty goods, retail sales, within a four-story, 332,884 square foot structure at 62 feet in height. Also, a five foot story uh, parking garage at 75 feet in height, along with surface parking on the lot. This would also include a 15 slip marina. Now, in accordance with section 70.51 for the statutes, a demand for relief was filed within the city, with, with the city. Four separate mediation sessions were held between May 7th, 2021 and October 22nd, 2021, during which the city and applicant explored revised terms of development. During the final mediation on October 22nd, 2021, the applicant presented the city with two alternative plans. And this was based on the Chemical Formulators Inc., also known as CFI, as I'll refer to in this presentation. This was at the location to the south at 5215 West Tyson. Alternative one would state that the uh, CFI would remain, and alternative two plan would have the CFI relocate its business. Now I'll talk about the alternative plans and how they, what they have in common. Each site plan seeks approval of a mixed-use project consisting of residential, multifamily, retail sales, specialty goods, convenience goods, and shopper's goods, and also marina uses. Specifically, 226 residential multifamily units or 20, uh, at 27 units per acre with pool and amenity space, 5,000 square feet of retail sales, specialty goods, convenience goods, and or shopper's goods, and also a 15 slip marina to the north. The, pro, uh, the project proposes to construct a 310,000 square foot four story structure consisting of residential multifamily and retail sales. This development would incorporate the use of the existing dock located to the north as part of the marina with a re residential multifamily complex designed central to the site where the structure is located at this time. Green space surrounds the residential multifamily uh, complex with internal pedestrian connections with open amenity space. The site layout incorporates a four-story garage along the surface parking to the south of the uh, site. And the retail sales component will be located to the northern end of the site fronting the water. The 8.37 acre property has an existing 67,667 square foot building with a light manufacturing use and as part of the Rattlesnake Point located to the north side of West Tyson Avenue. The site is surrounded by the Bay and Rattlesnake Channel to the north. Industrial uses to the west, uh, zone IG. Industrial uses to the south, zone IH. And commercial industrial government use to the east, um, zone IH. The proposed building setbacks are 35 feet to the north, 35 feet to the south, 36 feet to the east, and 50 feet to the west. The maximum height of the proposed project will be 60 feet or four stories for the residential multifamily complex and also the parking garage. Based on these proposed uh, number of dwelling units and retail sales, a total of 431 parking spaces are required and the applicant is providing 444 parking spaces. There are three loading spaces um, that are required and three loading spaces are being met. In addition, to making a mitigation payment to the transportation division in the amount of $99,581 for improvements within the inner bay district area, the applicant is required to pay is a, a proportionate fair share payment for the design and construction of a new traffic signal at the intersection of West Tyson and also um, Southwest 
Shore Boulevard, and also to contribute 174000 to the city to be utilized for the design and or improvements to Tyson Avenue. Now, I will show you the next page. You'll see alternative uh, site plan number one. The distinctions of site plan number one are show that CFI will remain in its current location right here to the south. The proposal uh, following design details and general notes conditions of approval in order to mitigate the impacts presented by CFI as required by the land use policy 8.11.5, which provides in part a proposed PD rezoning which abuts existing heavy industrial uses that are hazardous to the public health and safety must demonstrate through design and accepted practices that the occupants of the new use shall be shall not be unduly at risk from such hazards. Now, please keep in mind that, that staff report does not address whether alternative plan complies with the land use policy 8.11.5, but during the mediation, the city did confirm while staff was willing to present the alternative site plans for city council's consideration, the applicant uh, remained responsible for establishing compliance with policy 8.11.5 and to be competent of substantial evidence. I will go to the uh, next page. So as per uh, the alternative site plan number one, the applicant must meet the general notes 16 through 22. Now there's a lot of information, so I'll actually paraphrase piece by piece. Uh, note number 16, the developer shall maintain emergency response, evacuation, and re-entry plan for hurricanes and other disasters. Number 17, note, the developer shall enter into a contract with a private transportation system to provide private evacuation service in the event of a hurricane or similar threatening flooding and or wind event. Note number 18, the developer or property manager shall provide uh, perspective and new tenants with information identifying the fact that the unit is located within the coastal high hazard area. Note number 19, prior to the issuance of the first certificate of occupancy, temporary or final, developer shall install and maintain automatic warning systems along the southern perimeter. Uh, number 20 in the notes, uh, HVAC systems shall be designed with no fresh air intake, subject to city code. 21, the parking garage shall be enclosed on the south elevation other than vehicular and pedestrian access points on the ground floor. And number 22 in the notes, the 10 foot wall may be modified to a six foot wall if the adjacent heavy industrial chemical facility uh, use ceases operation. I'll now go, now go to alternative plan number two that the applicant is proposing. This shows CFI to the south relocating its business from the current location at 5215 West Tyson Avenue. Uh, it is not required to establish compliance with the land use policy 8.11.5. The alternative site plan number two provides uh, that the removal of the secondary access point to and through the property to the west and instead has one access point on West Tyson Avenue right down here to the south as you see uh, bolded here with the arrow. In addition, the journal notes that address the design specific issues in relation to the land use policy 8.11.5 uh, are not valid and they are also removed. I have the two sites here side by side, as you can see. You have that marina up here to the north. You will have uh, to the northeast, you'll have that retail. To the uh, southeast, you'll have that four-story garage. Throughout the center of the site, you'll have that residential multifamily structure, and you'll have the access point. Now, um, in alternative plan one, you'll have three lanes as compared to alternative plan two, where you will have two lanes. Alternative plan two, you'll have that one access as I spoke of, and alternative plan one, you'll have two access points as you see the bold uh, uh, entrance exit here and entrance exit uh, to the south. Uh, as you see, I went to the site uh, the other day and you'll see the, uh, the current structure uh, on the site as is. And to the north, you'll see a little bit more of the site as is. To the west of the site, you'll see uh, more industrial. 
And also to the west of the site, you'll see that access area and more industrial over here. To the east of the site, you'll have um, a military operations area. And down the street to the west of the site, you'll have Salt Shack, uh, a restaurant on the water. To the south of the site, you'll have industrial, down, this is on Tyson, so this is Tyson Road. You'll have industrial facilities. And directly south of the site, you'll have uh, the uh, CFI um, location that we're speaking of on 5215 West Tyson. To the south of the site, you'll see more industrial. And also, this is from Tyson Road, looking above. So you'll see 5215 right here, uh, gated area. And on the opposite side, you'll have the subject parcel. The development review and compliance staff has reviewed the petition and finds a subject to the applicant's establishment of compliance with land use policy 8.11.5, the request consistent with the applicable City of Tampa land development regulations. If approving the application, modifications of the site plan must be completed by the applicant between first and second reading of ordinance as stated on the revision sheet. Thank you so much. I'm here for any questions if needed. Any questions for Zane, gentlemen? Hey, uh, good evening, Council. Um, I'm going to agree it's really great to be uh, back in person. Um, if I may, I'm going to, given the uh, variety and significance of these issues tonight, um, I would respectfully request uh, some extra time. If I could have 10 minutes extra, I don't think I'm going to need it, but I would, um, I would request it. Let's see what's the rule on that. Mr. Chairman, this would apply to um, to quasi-judicial hearings, uh, so I would um, uh, say that this is all part and parcel of the um, of the um, uh, hearing tonight. Although your decisions are separate, but let me just read what the rule is: request for additional time may only be granted if the participant making the request establishes to the satisfaction of counsel that additional time is necessary to afford procedural due process. Counsel. Members may, by majority vote, grant or deny the request and determine the additional time necessary, if any. And in the event that a participant in a quasi-judicial public hearing is given additional time to make a presentation, then the petitioner, who is actually, in this case, asking for the additional time, um, may request additional time for purposes of rebuttal as necessary to afford procedural due process. Um, Council, this is uh, a settlement <coughs> negotiation. Uh, you have also heard that there is going to be a, an expert witness that is going to be presenting, um, which is part of the presentation. Uh, so it's council's discretion, but obviously um, uh, it is an issue of uh, procedural due process, and um, it is up to the city council. I, Let's go ahead and recognize. I, I move that we give them 10 more minutes. Uh -huh. yeah. Chairman, if, if we're going to do any, anything, and I, I'm not against anything that's been said at this point, I, I would suggest that the other side, whoever is going to be here, also given the additional same amount of time. All right. All right. Mr. Carlson, you have any motion, or sir, in reference to 10 minutes of both sides? Yes. Second. All right. Second. All right. Mr. Carlson, is that both sides additional 10 minutes if necessary? Ms. Maniscalco, second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion grant. You have your 10 minutes before. A total time, then, Madam Clerk, of. Twenty-five. Sorry. Twenty-five minutes. All right, Madam Clerk, are you, you good now? Do you need to you good? Now? No. All right. We'll bring you seat. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm Ann Pollock, uh, 433 Central Avenue in St. Pete. 
I represent Woodfield Acquisitions on this project. We have a big team working on this project, and um, they, these are they're all here tonight, either virtually or in person. Well, the Boy Scouts are going to leave now. So oh, let okay. Let, let me let them get out. And, uh, Thank you. You pause my time, my precious time. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> they don't want to stay. <laughs> this is where it gets exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Did you teach at Robinson High School? <coughs> yeah, you fix it for me too. All right. Thank you. All right, our young people are left now, so I guess we may proceed. All right. So for over 20 years, the city and this council have directed that this, this area transform from industrial to residential and commercial. The comprehensive plan was amended to CMU 35 for most of the peninsula over, and over the past three years, this council has approved the rezoning of several parcels on the, proper, on the peninsula to set in motion this transition and begin reconnecting the public back to the waterfront. We would like to continue the, that transition. When we were here more than a year ago, you raised several concerns, specifically in regard to the proposed density and the project's compatibility and safety given its location next to the chemical formulator site. We've worked diligently with your staff over the past year to address these concerns, and we'd like to share what we've done, how we meet the requirements for approval, and why you should feel comfortable supporting this project. The reconfigured project was explicitly designed to address your concerns and to ensure a development that's consistent with the density of what's been approved nearby, compatible with the neighborhood and surrounding uses, and consistent with the comprehensive plan policies ap applicable to it. Initially, we decreased the density by 25%, reducing it from the 299 units to 226. This puts us at 27 units per acre, which is directly compatible to the other projects this city council has approved recently nearby. Staff felt this was consistent with the comp plan and is certainly well below what's allowed with the 30 units per acre and the 1.0 FAR that's allowed by the CMU 35. We increased the commercial to 5,000 square feet to provide the mix of uses, but also expanded the types of uses allowed under the retail uh, to provide uh, a greater, uh, greater mix. This, uh, the, this commercial use is on the northeast side of the project, fronting the fully accessible waterfront, providing the most benefit to the public and the residents. The redesign plan shifts the buildings a bit, moving the garage east and the residential west away from the CFI site to the south. The garage is four stories, and the south wall was enclosed to provide greater protection to the residents. And we'll get into the, the full safety measures in a moment. The project remains a single building with courtyards and a lot of green space. In fact, we exceed the green space requirement by about 17%. This is the entrance as you drive up that long uh, pork chop driveway, uh, but ultimately the focus is on the interplay with the waterfront. So the Rattlesnake Point policies specifically require public access to the waterfront, and we've created a fully public waterfront promenade consistent with that. A public trail winding along the waterfront with cross access to the adjacent parcels, which hopefully will be developed in the near future to continue that path all the way around water, uh, Rattlesnake Point. It connects to the fire access driveway that encircles the property, which is, creates an additional one-third mile loop of the trail just within this property. We have lots of outdoor amenities as well as the commercial retail restaurant space supporting the waterfront users and natural features to further protect the property from storm surge and storm damage. What makes this site special is this 15 slip marina that is planned to be redeveloped from the old boat dock that was there from the boat manufacturing plant. So you can access by boat, bike, or car. There's surface parking along the west side, but the, uh, the parking garage is fully accessible to the public. We are requesting a waiver to the landscape buffer but our redesign has significantly decreased from what we originally requested when we came to you. That unique pork chop shape gives us this limited driveway space. So in order to make room for the necessary driveway lanes that we're required to have because we're adjacent to CFI, 
um, and to protect the trees and to provide the required sidewalk, we're requesting to decrease that landscape buffer on the west side from 10 feet to five, uh, from 15 feet to 10 feet. Um, it's because we're adjacent to industrial. We have tried to limit it as much as possible, and we are uh, committing to put the full 15 feet of, of landscaping material in that 10 feet space. And you can see that the other side of the sidewalk actually has more green space on it, but we can't actually count that towards the buffer. So we really have um, made uh, the intent of the met the intent of the code. Um, but even though it doesn't count, we're also requesting a 10-foot wall on the south side of the property to uh, mitigate for the adjacent CFI use. But we do have to ask for a waiver for that. So we do believe these waivers are in harmony with the intent of the code and result in substantial justice given the public benefit. The Planning Commission and City staff have found the project with the reduced density and modified conditions consistent with the comp plan and the land development code uh, provisions and compatible with the surrounding area. We've also submitted into the record an independent planning report by Cynthia Spidell, certified planner with Stearns Weaver Miller, who is here tonight and can answer any questions that you have. Um, I want to highlight that we are consistent with the CMU 35, with the coastal management objectives of the, poli of the comp plan, the mixed use corridor policies, the land development code, um, and given the larger issues, I'm going to go um, just briefly through some of the rattlesnake point policies that are applicable. Uh, 8.11.6 is the transportation mitigation requirement. Uh, we are in a TCEA transportation concurrency exception area, which requires that we comply with all code required transportation conditions of approval, which as you've heard multiple times tonight, we have done. We are committed to paying our proportionate fair share mitigation payment, and we are committing to pay for the traffic signal at Tyson and West Shore, which typically is paid two years from now, um, two years from development um, after you do a study, um, but we are committing to pay that upfront at building permit. In addition, as part of this settlement, we are committing to pay $174,000 uh, towards improvements to Tyson. Um, recognizing that Tyson is a uh, substandard road that really needs a lot of help, we are committing to doing that. Uh, so we really are um, paying, fully mitigating our impact plus some as more than what's required by code. And our uh, traffic engineer, Steve Henry, is on the line to answer any questions that you might have about that. Oh, no, put it back. Um, so um, 8.11.7 is the other one I want to mention. Um, that and the coastal management element um, provide that uh, rezonings are required to mitigate their impact on the coastal high hazard area by mitigating their impact on shelter space. So we have committed to make the required payment required by the land development code and the planning commission has confirmed that this makes us consistent with this policy. But we've also submitted an independent report into the record by Randy Cohen who is here tonight virtually to answer any questions. His report um, shows that evacuation traffic from the site will not have a negative regional or local impact on the primary evacuation routes serving the project. But despite those results, we've committed to an emergency planning response and recovery plan to make sure any evacuation process is safe, is smooth, and the least impactful on our residents and on the community, including requiring notice to tenants of the nature of where they're living, where they're moving in, required information about evacuation, evacuation requirements, and providing an evacuation transportation um, service for those who can't evacuate on their own. So um, we've discussed, uh, this is 8.11.5, we've discussed transportation and shelter mitigation, we've demonstrated public access to the waterfront. The elephant in the room, of course, is CFI and as our neighbor. So what we have done is to institute evidence-based, expert-approved mitigation measures in concert with a full understanding of how the facility operates and is regulated and how chlorine works, which is what they primarily do at that facility, so that we can ensure that the residents are not unduly at risk and meet the standards of this policy. Um, and this last provision is not, it is not relevant. So as um, staff and Kate explained, the settlement involves two alternatives. One, if CFI stays, which we hope at this point would just be temporary anyway, even if they did stay, and one if they go. 
because that latter option seems at this point like a distinct possibility, but still is completely out of our hands and is a confidential matter between third parties and we don't really have a role in that, we would ask for that flexibility and that's why we're asking for you to approve both plans. So if it does happen, we have that option of picking that plan and being able to move forward. So everything we've talked about so far applies to both alternative plans, the density reduction, the mix of uses, the layout, the waterfront promenade. But what we've done in this alternative plan one is to provide those expert approved evidence-based mitigation measures to ensure that the residents are not unduly unsafe. And these measures that we've provided, I think go well beyond what the, the comp plan requires of design and accepted practices. So I'm gonna briefly go through them again. We've shifted the garage uh, east and moved the residents that were once close to that CFI site, we've moved them west. We've redesigned the garage with a solid southern wall. We have that 10 foot wall along the south boundary. We have a third lane on the primary access driveway so that CFI trucks that at this point use that driveway to enter their property, they have their own access driveway and they won't interfere with the residents using the driveway themselves. But we've also added that secondary access driveway so the residents don't even have to use that primary access driveway. Then we've added a chlorine monitoring system so that any level of chlorine that escapes, if it happens to happen, which it shouldn't, um, we get an alert. And then we can have our alert system, our communication system alert the residents. There's no fresh air HVAC required per code. So shelter in place, which is the appropriate method for an emergency with chlorine, the residents get an emergency a warning, they go inside, they be safe inside. And we have our emergency response plan that is effective for hurricanes or for CFI, and all the residents are made aware, they have education, and they're, then they are, are safe. So we feel this is appropriate. So um, uh, what I wanna point out is the Planning Commission has found us consistent with 8.11.5, and in addition, over the past year, we've worked with uh, CFI and CFI, um, while originally a zealous opponent, we have a letter of uh, that they do not oppose this plan and that they have uh, determined that they will, um, you know, support this plan tonight. So, and I can submit that into the record. Um, so, um, obviously, you can't take my word for it. I'm not the chemical expert. Um, so tonight, I'm gonna introduce you to Paul Noni, who is online. He's our principal toxicologist with CTEH, nationally renowned emergency environmental response and industrial hygiene company. And he's gonna talk to you about background on chlorine, CFI's facility, how it's regulated, and the incredible in advancement in safety technology over the past five to 15 years, um, and why the mitigation that we're proposing really is appropriate and sufficient for this site. Sister has a question. Yes. Would you put up that fire? Uh, yes. This one now. Just for my uh, questioning and other people that might be wondering as soon as it comes back up. The blue lines that are on that, are those signifying the rail lines? Yes. Uh-huh. Let's wait till they come up. Okay. I, the one that is going in front of the main drive. Yes. That one there. And now let's go up to midway up where you have the other e entrance exit or the, the that exit. Where does that lead to? That one will go through the property to the west. Um, as that property what? is developed, which is uh, being proposed, that, th uh, that one will be connected and that driveway will come out through here. Will that driveway still cross the railroad track? It will, as, but my understanding is that railroad track, as, as, as what's proposed to be happening here, this line is in the process of being decommissioned sooner rather than later. The but woman, yes. The woman who is to your left, is oh, she with me. CSX? Yes. No. No, sir. Okay, I'm Nicole, Nicole Lynn. I'm with the applicant uh, with our Dura Group, 4921 Memorial Highway, Tampa. Um, the adjacent um, use actually has an entrance already that connects back down and around to the south side of the track. Therefore, you would be able to cross over through that property, through that cross access, without having to recross 
the, so, the private line at that point, it, private rail line. Is, is this all proposed or is this definite? This is existing. There's already um, a space to the west of where that private rail line ends that you can drive through now. But for the time being, with that property not being developed to the west, eventually you're going to have to... There's an existing gate there, sir, already, so you can already access it. It's not as improved as it would be with redevelopment. <coughs> at this at this point, it's not it's not improved. So, which means if, if you drive a Ford F one fifty or an SUV or something like that, or a four wheel drive, you can get across the unimproved section to get around. You can get across it in a sedan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have one question. Uh, when we talk about the, the deal, the two alternatives. Yes. Uh, Ms. Wells, will that be in writing to where if the one party does not vacate the other side that the deal will stand firm and, and that way they, they don't be nig on just doing one alternative versus one stays or it goes? I mean, how does that work? Um, so so what, what the, the alternative proposes is that um, if uh, CFI sells the property, um, th then essentially the, the proposal for their sale is that they would leave within two years of them selling the property. And the site plan commits that we would not be allowed to have residents move in within that two-year period. So th that would be the um, essentially the enforcement that would allow, restrict, the, the pr provide for the safety measure that would ensure that the residents would not be moving in when the CFI facility was still operating. It, it, it provides for the end of the operation of the CFI facility. All right, you may proceed. That, that was sort of the, the, the way to get around to, to ensure that there wasn't, the CFI wasn't operating in, in, in order to avoid having to deal with the mitigation. And there's expectations that that is um, either in the works or going to happen soon, but certainly nothing, um, nothing would start until the property had actually been sold. And so the idea is if uh, Woodfield um, starts immediately, then, um, you know, and, and they haven't sold, then nothing would really be triggered and we would move forward under the first alternative. But we're hopeful that things move along quickly. All right, we'll proceed. All right, is Mr. Noni, is he online? Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you, sir. Okay, great. Have you, have you been sworn in, sir? Were you sworn in earlier? My camera was off and I didn't know it was my right, time. So. Swear you now. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Okay, uh, good evening to the council members and uh, staff and the public that are attendance of this meeting. My name is Dr. Paul Noni. I am a toxicologist. I have a PhD in toxicology. I'm also a certified industrial hygienist and a certified safety professional. I've got over 19 years experience in chemical emergency planning, response, including response to chlorine releases, such as the uh, 2005 Graniteville, South Carolina derailment, and more recently, the 2019 Bartow, Georgia chlorine derailment. I wanna talk a little bit about the behavior of chlorine in the environment and go into some of the safety issues that are here. Uh, chlorine, when it's released, it emerges as a heavy, dense gas. Uh, when that compressed liquid comes out of something like a tank car, uh, it tends to stay low to the ground until it warms up, and thus it's susceptible to barriers like walls that could prevent its mitigation, mitigation or migration along the ground. Smaller releases like from a valve on a tank car or a facility tend to start as a gas and do not travel very far before they dissipate. Uh, chlorine gas dissipates faster in warmer weather, such as is typical for Tampa and will travel in the direction of the prevalent wind. Based on historical uh, meteorological data, the proposed Woodfield development would only be downwind of the CFI facility at about 18% at the time, 1-8, 18%. So a little bit about how 
fluorine is transported and stored. Fluorine is transported in 90 ton rail tank cars that go over the mainline rails like CSX's rail, but all across the country in the U.S. and every major city. Uh, it's transported in smaller containers for local distribution. Today, chlorine tank cars are the most robust tank cars that have ever been on the rail. January of, to of 2009, DOT required the development of a next generation tank car that had full support of the chemical industry. The new tank car has enhanced side impact puncture resistance. It's got head shield armor of a half inch thick steel. It's got strengthened valves, top fittings, and nozzles. Chlorine tank cars also consist of an outer steel jacket. There's an internal insulation layer of materials like ceramic fibers and fiberglass. And there's an internal one inch thick steel tank that contains the liquid chlorine under pressure. These tank cars are made to withstand unbelievably heavy forces like those generated in a high speed train derailment or what could be perceived to occur due to attempted sabotage or terrorism. Um, chlorine is very rarely released from rail tank cars in large volumes. And historically, that's only happened because of major train derailments at high speeds. Storage of a loaded chlorine tank car on a spur rail or slow speed movements of chlorine tankers on, on rail lines, such as the case for chlorine movements in and out of CFI, present practically zero risk of a large scale release because of the armor on these tank cars. It just doesn't happen because of how strong the cars are. The safest place for a chlorine rail tank car to be from, from an accidental release standpoint is in a secured location, stationary, with the valves properly secured like they are at CFI. Smaller non-derailment releases, so this would be a release of gas that occurs not because the, trains, the train has collided, uh, but from a rail tank car down 50% since 2010. In 2019, there were only four small releases in transportation involving chlorine in the U.S. and Canada, and that's out of more than 52,000 shipments. The release mitigation technologies for small releases of chlorine have greatly advanced in recent years, such that these releases are kept small and are lower impact if they even occur at all. We've come a long way since uh, even the 90s and the two, early 2000s with chlorine safety. Most small chlorine releases occur due to improperly closed or, sec or secured valves at the shipper. And so these issues are unlikely to arise after a tank car has traveled many, many miles and been delivered and is in storage at a facility like CFI. So I want to talk a little bit about the uh, CFI's chlorine safety management system. Uh, they've implemented numerous preventive and mitigative controls to eliminate or minimize any offsite impact of a chlorine release during their operations. For example, the bleach production building is enclosed and it's equipped with a chlorine gas scrubber and a chlorine gas detection system that can trigger an auto shutdown mechanism if chlorine gas is detected to shut the whole system down. The rail car unloading area is equipped with a deluge system that would release a chemical that would capture any chlorine uh, that was released uh, if vapors were detected during the chlorine transfer process on the rail uh, dome transfer uh, facility. Excess flow valves are engaged during the chlorine transfer process that will close if there's a break in the system and that would prevent significant amounts of chlorine from being released. And finally, the CFI facility perimeter fence line is equipped with a chlorine detection system that would alarm if they had a significant chlorine release. So CFI's preventive and mitigative controls and their emergency response procedures have been evaluated and approved by representatives of Hillsborough County. Uh, we have memos from the, the Hillsborough County EPC indicating that CFI has installed proper preventive systems to minimize or eliminate chlorine releases from their operations. So again, I wanna go into some of the mitigation procedures that have been proposed for uh, alternate one. Uh, Woodfield's updated plans have several additional design factors that would provide greater protection for residents and visitors should a release of chlorine from CFI migrate onto the property. So shifting the residents away from the Southeast property boundary gives us more distance. Distance is important for chemical releases. Uh, there's a 10 foot wall proposed along the southern boundary of the development. Uh, as I mentioned before, if there's a large scale release, which is highly unlikely from these rail cars, but if there was, chlorine tends to migrate along the ground. A 10 foot wall would prevent 
uh, significant concentrations of chlorine from, or at least it would provide a barrier. It would inhibit the, the migration of those uh, concentrations of chlorine uh, from moving that way. And, that, and that's only if the uh, prevailing winds are from the south. So as I mentioned, the prevailing winds are not likely to be some from the south, only 18% of the time, but this wall would help with that. Redesigning the parking garage with the closed southern walls will be an additional barrier for anything that might come across the 10 foot wall. Uh, talked about the additional ingress egress routes, should there be an incident and the public is there and people go to their cars, there would be extra uh, uh, egress routes for them to get out of the facility or get to get out of the uh, the development. Um, the proposal to install a fence line chlorine monitoring system aligned with a public shelter in place warning system is really key. We know CFI has a fence line system uh, being able for this development to detect chlorine and have a uh, notification in place to get people to shelter in place inside their buildings that uh, incidentally would not have any intakes that could bring chlorine from the outside uh, would be very effective at uh, providing people a place to go and to be able to wait out the incident uh, as the chlorine dissipates. And finally, the comprehensive emergency response plan that can be disseminated and exercised by the development's management and its residents with its neighbors in the city of Tampa is, is key. And that's in, in the plans as well. So just to summarize, uh, the net effect of all of these factors from what CFI has done to be safer and what the proposed mitigations are for the property is that there is a very small risk of a significant chlorine release from the CFI facility resulting in injuries to residents and or visitors to the proposed development. In my opinion, based on the regulation of chlorine use today, handling and CFI's ability to prevent or stop chlorine releases before there's offsite impact. This apartment use with these mitigation measures means that the residents will not be unduly at risk. That's all I have. Thank you. Any questions, gentlemen? Uh, I just, um, I, I certainly don't know the amount of technology and information that this gentleman, he's an expert, and rightly so, but. Can we said stop our time while we have questions? Here. Thank you. Sorry. You said something happens very rarely. What does rarely mean? That means that it's happened before. I assume if it's happened rarely, yes. that means it's happened before. Am I correct? Yes, you are correct. Nuclear plants are built not to withstand, they're built to withstand a lot, and some of them have gone down. Am I correct? In the past, they have, yes. Less, lesser. So what uh, are the percentages? And, and, and we're making assumptions here in my part, and I'm not questioning you, sir, at all. I'm talking to the whole sphere of conversation up to now has been that this railroad won't be there, that this is coming down, that this is going to move, that this is not going to leak. I'm a factual type guy, and I don't know exactly what all that means that we all talked about on both sides of the aisle here. So I, I just, for my clarity, I like to know the percentages of these things that are happening. Uh, if the railroad's going to go across the vacant land that's there now, I assume that's what I heard, I, I believe, earlier. And there was conversation about Oh, don't worry, this is going to happen, and then this will happen, but what happens if this doesn't happen to the whole scheme? There's a lot of assumptions that I'm not positive on, and I'd like to have some clarity on what was said for the last 40 minutes. Sure, I, I assume that's to me, and I, I, would, I would say that what I'm here to talk about is about risk, and there, there's nothing that goes with zero risk. So we'll, we need to get that out clearly. We all take risks every day. Um, I think what I've tried to do with my analysis here is to understand uh, what are the risks, and and but you can go back and look in time. There have been uh, accidental releases of chlorine from tank cars that are sitting still uh, because the valve had a malfunction or somebody took a, a hose off too early before they closed the valve. There, there's human error always at, at risk. That, that creates a risk. But we also have to look at so what do we have that risk from becoming a health impact. Well, then, and, what, excuse me. I'm sorry. Well, then, what I'm understanding very rarely mean only by human mistake or human error that these things happen. The tank has not ever been manufactured malfunctionally to explode or malfunctionally. Nothing's ever happened to the tank. It's always been by human error. 
Well, you, you could call the manufacturer problems human error, too. I, I would say that uh, there certainly have been design faults that maybe didn't uh, sh should have been caught in inspection and were not caught. And that's happened before where they fill these these large uh, pouring tank cars up at the shippers. That has happened before. But when I talk about four non-accident related releases of chlorine out of 52,000 shipments in 2019, that's in the US and Canada, that would be the most likely scenario here. The mitigation mechanisms that are in place to catch if one of those four out of 52,000 happened at CFI, there are, there are significant mitigation measures in place on site as well as off site if, if it was a significant enough release to have uh, impact on the, the proposed development. These mitigation measures that have been proposed would greatly reduce impacts. Well, thank you. But I, I, I still don't understand. I, uh, I, I guess a percentage would be of all the facilities like this in the whole country that have a problem, then you can just say that the system, not just one site, the system has this percent of whatever is out there. So when we go to one site, it can't just be based on one site. It's got to be on the basis of all the systems combined with the ratios of accidents or human error. I'm not arguing. I'm just saying my point. That's all. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Sheriff, if, if, I'm, if I may, I, in our packet of information that we get, I'm looking at a report from Apex, A-P-E-X. Do you know who they are? Yes, I'm familiar with them. Uh, it, and in that packet that was put together uh, as a hazard assessment for proposed residential community development next to a bleach plant, and a chlorine plant is a bleach plant, correct? Uh, in this case, CFI is. That's and, and it was prepared for the CEO of Gulfstream Yachts, which is at 5251 West Tyson. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the long list of things, but it says long-term exposure to low concentrations is problematic. And that this came from a 2011 study. And that some of the things are preterm birth, uh, severe respiratory, uh, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, acute respiratory disease syndrome, and that's just some of the things that were in this report. But I'm going back down to what my main concern was, the transportation of this chlorine, chlorine gas, what, whatever is manufactured or, or the byproduct of. And it said transporting, transporting, excuse me, chlorine also poses more risk than any other regulated substance. Now, this report came from 2005 to 2009. However, chlorine led the list with 83 major injuries and nine fatalities out of 48 rail and road accidents compared to gasoline transportation. Again, my concern has always been with the rail, the shipment of the chlorine, the close proximity to a residential facility, but more especially, if there was an accident, and I know there's, there's going to be mitigation proposed in case something happens, but if those entrance and exits are blocked by these rail cars for whatever is seen. Uh, again, as Mr. Miranda, we're laying this, and we're not just, I'm not disputing what you had to say, but this, this, Documentation in front of me is, is, is saying slight variations. So I, I thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. It, it, I need whoever's uh, talking or whatever they're doing, they need to mute their mics because we're getting a lot of feedback and conversation. Mr. Carlson, you recognize. Thank you, sir. Um, the the entrance to this, as I as I understand the map, has a the rail going across a road, and you talked about in detail the armor that's around these new cars. Um, if if someone was in a pickup truck driving at high speed, drunk or whatever, and hit one of these, you know how how um, protected are they? Is there is it, it could a car hit 
could a car hitting it at 30 miles an hour uh, cause it to rupture or would it take 100 miles an hour, any idea? May I just make a, 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 just a quick remark that the rail line, um, when we were looking at the lines, the spur line um, on the east side to CFI, those are where the rail lines with the uh, chlorine ha are. This, this is the chlorine, this is corn syrup. This is going up to okay, the okay. corn syrup factory. And so, what about to get on the? Um, so on the, so the, up here, the, the CFI line, um, the, the, the rail line the, <clears throat> into there. Trying and to get on the peninsula. Is there a map of the whole peninsula? Um, I think we have one in the beginning, yes. To get into the, yes. My, so he, I, I'm sorry, I'll let you explain, but I just wanted to clarify that the line crossing our, this particular driveway does not have the, the chlorine in it. But Mr. Noni, I think you can explain about. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, so could you just tell us where the. Um, so the, the rail line comes in here and then um, connects this way into the CFI site. Uh, it continues um, so it doesn't, this way. So just the people that are getting to your facility, where would, would they cross that rail line at all or where, and where? Um, they would not cross the rail line. Um, well, they, they potentially would. The rail line comes all the way from um, downtown Tampa. It runs all the way through South Tampa. But just, uh, on, this, Tampa. just on this peninsula. But on they, this peninsula, it, it runs down Tyson. So, that, so they would be parallel to it but never cross it. Right. Um, and, and then they, would, um, and they wouldn't cross it for the driveway. Oh, okay. and, and Nicole, for the driveway, but the rail actually crosses Tyson at, um, closer to West Shore Boulevard. So, so at, the, at the signal, it crosses okay. over. Okay. So, so anyone crossing public. into uh, Rattlesnake. And what about it, where it goes parallel? Is it possible that a, a truck could veer over, you know, somebody's drunk and veers over and hits the... Sure, yes. So any Anybody in the public could Okay, could well, thank you so much sure. for clarifying yes. that. Um, yes. Back to the uh, chem toxicologist. Um, so, it, but is it, it, do you have any idea if a, so, so now the car might not hit it head on, but it might turn and hit it on the side. Is it, is it something that if a car hits at low speed, it, it would cause it to rupture or if somebody hit it, how high of a speed and how big of a car would it take to rupture it? So that's a good question. I, I've seen train derailments where the chlorine car has been hit by other fully loaded freight train cars and it just has scratches on the outer shell. Okay. Uh, if, if you drove your truck 100 miles an hour into one of these tank cars head on, you would destroy your truck and there would be a few scratches in the paint. In the huh. Interesting. These we things are build. designed to survive 60 mile an hour train derailments. We should build houses out of it. Um, the second thing is, um, uh, so you said it's very unlikely that there would be any kind of leak. Uh, but if there was, um, and it, some of it got over the fence and, and went into one of the units. Um, what kind of impact would it have on the people inside and would it make a difference whether they had their window open or their air conditioner on? Uh, is there any protection from windows closed and air conditioner? And, and how would it, would, would it have a mild effect on the people or a serious impact? Well, the, the thing to remember is chlorine wants to dissipate into the environment and so it's going to be a rather short duration event if it's a small release like from a, from a valve. Um, and so people that are outside are probably going to smell it. Uh, it will smell like uh, your nearest swimming pool. Um, it can have short-term irritation effects that, that people would, would have no problem surviving and have no uh, ongoing effects. But, but, what, but what I feel like has been done to mitigate severe injury is getting the people farther away, having a plan in place for them to know where they're supposed to go shelter if there's an alarm, having that alarm system along the fence line. There's a lot of ways here to get people notified because times of the S, there's a release, get people inside, HVA systems are not going to pull fresh air from outside. That's part of the code uh, for the development of this uh, of these buildings. So they wouldn't have to shut down their, their internal uh, HVAC system. Uh, so keeping people farther away, giving them more distance, having a way inside that's not going to be impacted. Now that doesn't mean that no chlorine could come in through somebody's window, but we've seen, it's been studied, we've seen it for years and years and years with, with these types of chemicals, that any type of barrier helps. There have people, been people that survived large scale, well, in Graniteville, South Carolina, um, a woman survived in her car 
50 feet away from the wreck while there were people farther away that died. Her car provided her enough uh, protection that she survived in that, in that chlorine But cloud. if she was, if, um, and just asking questions for education, it, so, but if, if she was standing 50 feet away without a car, then what would have happened? That would not have been good. She would have been exposed to probably uh, very highly injurious amounts of chlorine. Okay. All right, thank you, sir. Did you uh, no, I'll, I'll reserve my question for later. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Central, you're sitting here now. You used to sit right there, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll be and, 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 and I noticed when you used to sit there, because when I used to sit, my, sit right there, the air quality sometimes, you, I don't know. Mr. Moran, we, we cough, right? Well, you and I have the same yeah, air to <laughs> we, we, we cough because the air in the room will... will this building or whatever makes us kind of, I wouldn't say sick, but irritates us. Mr. Chairman, I'm just going to ask you if you could just confine your discussion. No, I'm getting there, Mr. Shelby. I'm getting there. Okay. Uh, what I'm trying to say is this. When you talk about constructing a wall, we breathe air. I'm just trying to figure out how is this wall going to stop chlorine in the air to people, but we're saying the mitigation is to put a wall. So I'm looking at if I, if every day, if pollen drops on my car every day, and I see all this yellow grease on my car, how is the wall gonna stop? I mean, I, well, I, it's different. Yeah, you're right, it's different, but we breathe that every day. I was at a, a event just, just on Sunday, and I'm around trees and I'm breathing it. But my question still remains is, if I have a wall that you're saying is the mitigating point, <coughs> <coughs> to stop the chlorine, how does that work? I'm just, I don't understand how that works. I think you can, I think can Mr. I Noni that? can be explained Mr. Noni how chlorine explain works, it. yeah. Yeah, so um, chlorine gas is a dense gas, so it tends to hug the ground. So what we've seen in real releases and in test releases at, that if we have barriers on the ground, it will inhibit the chlorine cloud from moving. And anything you can do to slow it down while it warms up, which the warmer it gets, then it wants to go up into the atmosphere. And anything you can do to slow it down, that's going to help keep it closer to the source while it warms up and dissipates into the atmosphere. So if the chlorine didn't behave like that, I, I would totally understand what you're saying. But if we're, the biggest threat here is a large scale liquid release that creates a dense gas. And with that dense gas, it wants to travel along the ground. If it hits a wall, it will cool up right it's not just going to go up and jump the wall and keep going. It's going to get pulled up. And we've seen that in studies out in the desert of Utah with the Department of Homeland Security. Um, that it's a well-known property of chlorine gas. All right, he answered my question. I had it there. Anyone else? I'm not trying to be redundant, but and I'm not trying to be disputed in any way, but all the assumptions that we're making here is based on the atmosphere and the level of humidity in the air. And I'm not a scientist, believe me, I'm not. But if you had a day like today with a hair thick and heavy, that wind is not gonna carry it and dissipate it. It's gonna be stagnant for a while. Or if you have another assumption, that is by, and it could happen here, I hope it never happens, and it hasn't happened in a while. But certainly the things that come up from Africa, the, uh, they call hurricanes, and you have a lot of time, but something happens, and, and, and this is an assumption on my part. It's like we're hearing a point, assumption on everyone's part. And, and this, but I'm not talking about the zoning, I'm talking about the chlorine who happens to be near the zoning. What happens if one of those tanker trucks turns over? It's stuck there, it's stopped there, you can't move because of the hurricane, you have to leave, you have now, you said you have, and, and I chuckle at myself sometimes because everybody's saying we'll provide and transportation to get out. <laughs> that providing there's nobody in front of you. All over the city, all over the world, it's the same thing. You can provide all you want, but if the traffic is not moving, what you provided doesn't work. I mean, that's not an assumption, that's a fact. And even though that we allow, and during the hurricane season, you got two or three day notice where it's about going to hit. And you can leave, but us, we're humans, we say, nah, we can leave tomorrow. We can leave in an hour. And what happens, you have a jam all over. 
something can happen in Ocala and people down here can't get out. This, this is a fact. This is not, but I'm not against something like this, but I'm against speaking in, in superlatives that, uh, in my opinion, have flaws. They have flaws because you're not taking in the uncommon thing of nature. Nature is the most powerful thing in the world. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chair, Chair to, to follow on that, uh, item number 17, which you showed us, was transportation in case of evacuation order. And on Councilman Miranda's point, your expert witness said time is of the essence. Time is of the essence. Going back to what to Ms. Miranda said, that if a railroad train, uh, railroad crossing is blocked, whether it be in front of the chemical treatment plant or at the other end of Tyson where it crosses Tyson, time is of the essence. How are people going to get in to evacuate those people out? Thank you, Mr. Chair. You may continue, Mr. Chair. Well, um, I, I want to um, just let you know that part of the reason we brought Dr. Noni here is because he is a scientist. He's speaking about the strength of these tankers, uh, CFI's um, uh, regulations and requirements to ensure that they are um, uh, effective during a hurricane, that they are strong enough that they can withstand um, a 100 mile an hour uh, pickup truck and you know a, a terrorism, a high speed uh, crash, um, so that um, they, they can, uh, that the, the, the most likely, and even that is not likely, is a small um, event that would be withstood by the mitigation measures that CFI is already having that we would add to by our mitigation measures. And certainly we have requirements in our own plans um, that would allow us to protect our residents both from um, the, the dangers potentially from CFI and as well as the dangers from a hurricane requiring them to evacuate when the, her evacuation orders are issued by uh, Pinellas and Hillsborough County. Um, so uh, further questions we can certainly have uh, Dr. Noni address. With regard to transportation, certainly um, after 2009, the regulations changed significantly and that's why um, events have decreased significantly. And I think Dr. Noni can talk more about that when we have rebuttal. Um, but what I would like to just uh, say is that we, we've, we've come with significant um, changes to address your concerns. We've decreased density significantly. Um, we've we've um, made important changes to the design of the development. We've made the project more compatible with the surrounding industrial uses, and in particular with CFI. We've worked very hard with city staff. We've worked uh, very hard with uh, chemical formulators. We've got a plan that Mr. Steady recommends that the Planning Commission finds consistent with 8.11.5, that the city staff finds uh, compatible with the Land Development Code and the Comprehensive Plan. We're in an area where um, we're finding the industrial and the residential meeting each other. And this is definitely a complicated uh, thing that we're trying to resolve. Um, but we have complied with the city's requirements. We've met our burden with competent substantial evidence in the record. We've met our burden in, in doing that tonight. And we uh, would respectfully request that you approve our project tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you. Goodness. Ask the toxicologist one more question. Is he still there before he leaves? <clears throat> and legal cut me off if you don't like this question but it uh professor or doctor um in 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 10 years it, let's say we approve this tonight and then in 10 years a big event happens and the press descends on the project and says why did the stupid city council back when vote this in what would you say to the if you were there what would you say uh in our defense at that time what, what would you say about the decision we made tonight um, in our defense? Well, I would say that there, there's, there's no decision that doesn't come without some consideration. And I think what, what I see before, before this group um, is a decision that involves a lot of science, a lot of data, 
a lot of understanding of the difference between where we were in the 90s and the early 2000s and where we are now with chemical safety. And, um, you know, you can't keep every incident from happening, but if an incident does happen, I think you've got enough science and you've got enough mitigated procedures and you've got enough um, information at your disposal to say the chances of something like this happening were so low that it didn't make sense uh, not to approve I, that, that. And as a scientist and as a toxicologist, and I, I work with these things all the time. And if, if people really knew where the risks were around their homes, you know, as we sit here today, uh, they'd probably have their eyes open. Um, I, I just don't see that the residents of this facility are you know, unduly at risk in this situation. And I would, I, I would come defend what I've told you because it's the truth, it's scientifically backed, and this is how we assess risk. You know, there's never no risk. And we weigh it and we say, what are the chances of something bad happening? What, one, and, one more question if I could. Um, <clears throat> these cars go on a train. Um, through South Tampa. So they're going through a lot of other neighborhoods. I don't remember the map exactly. Mm -hmm. And you talked about the safety of those. How, how much is the relative risk of the processing facility then versus the cars sound pretty, they sound like tanks on, on a train, but um, what's, the, what's the relative risk of the processing of it to turn the bleach? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so what's going on? At a facility like CFI, there's a lot more management and handling of the chlorine. That's why there are these mitigation uh, procedures in place, the uh, auto shutoff valves, the deluge system on the rail car transfer uh, apparatus. But all that, all that is because when we're moving chlorine from one container to another, we're putting it in the process. When the tanks are going down the mainline rail, the faster they go, the better the chance is, albeit these days much less, but the better the chance is that they have an incident that could cause catastrophic rupture of that inner tank. The chances of that happening when CSX is pushing a, uh, a line of cars into CFI at probably five miles an hour at the most are practically zero. I, I'm aware of zero incidents of catastrophic tank failures, pouring tank cars, even the old tank when they're only moving five miles an hour and have a, have a wreck. It, it has to involve high speed. Okay, thank you. All right, does she have any more time on the clock? Uh, if I could save that for One minute and 45 seconds. All right, no problem. Thank you so much. All right, we'll go to the uh, public. You say that she had requested that time be put on rebuttal. Did, did you rule on that? I didn't hear what, what you said with regard to rebuttal. We did. Okay, so mm -hmm. it would be, okay. All right, we stand recess. And again, counsel, just a, a reminder just to make sure that it's in your yes, travels, yes, you, you don't uh, overhear any discussion, please. Thank you.
officers back in session. Roll call. Carlson. Here. Maniscalco. Here. Citro. Here. Vieira. Here. Miranda. Here. And Goods. Here. We have a fiscal quorum. All right. We'll hear from the uh, citizens now. Now, I get more than three minutes, right? Because they got an extra 10. Uh, let's not debate about it for two minutes. Just give me two minutes. Come on now. That's, a, that's only fair. <laughs> we, already, we, we already said that earlier. So. OK, thank you. You want five minutes? Move, move five thank minutes. you. Give it to Carol Ann, too, while you're at it. OK, um, good evening, gentlemen. Um, there's a couple things that I wanted to point out. Um, they didn't talk about in this plan, having a plan if there's a chlorine thing. They, they said something about making we, sure. We, we know I'm sorry. who you are. My name is Stephanie Pointer, and I'm here to speak. I don't know what I'm here to speak about. But anyway, I, I just wanted to point out a few things that, that I heard this evening. Um, that there was no plan to notify the tenants that there was going to be a hazardous chemical plant next door. Hopefully, it won't be there. Um, there was no, um, in, in the tenant waivers. Um, I, I'd love to know if um, Tampa Fire Department now has a plan because I sent you guys an email and to the Q, QJ box earlier this week that Tampa PD in December had no plan for CFI. Um, is there a plan now? What is it? When was it developed? Um, there's over a million square feet of residential space within 200 yards of this facility of the facility um i want to know where the ninety-nine thousand dollars for inner bay is going to go what's it going to be spent on um so no, let me get back to my original speech um good evening gentlemen um i you guys all know that i do not like plywood palaces but 226 is better than 299. i'd like to see some affordable and some workforce in the mix I asked for it. We have none currently approved for South of Gandy. Woodfield would be gracious, could be gracious, and add some affordable or workforce housing to this situation. Um, with that being said, I have no envy for you tonight. You have two choices. Turn down this project and get sued by the de developer for infringement of their other rights, or approve it and get sued if there's an accident with the hazardous chemical plant. Um, abutting this property. I don't see that the city re has any experts presenting that say that it's safe to build there. Of course, we've seen the, represent the, the developer's expert, but they're not going to tell you the things that you, how do you know you can trust that person? How do you know that they're going to, they're not going to stand up here and tell you that it's a dangerous situation. So if the city doesn't have experts, who do you trust? Well, I would imagine the EPC would be a good place to go. The pink sheet that I gave you, that very front sheet, is a um, real quick and dirty on what the EPC provided to the legal department in May. And it had a whole bunch of things on there about, the, um, about accidents that had happened over the time that uh, CFI has been there. Um, I asked city council today to make a motion tonight to have city staff report back to them on the status of CFI every 60 days. I also asked city council to make a motion tonight to have staff report how we can use the increase in tax revenue. If you look at that white paper, I'd like for you to look at the, the spreadsheet looking paper that's in your packet. Um, just from two of those apartment complexes on Rattlesnake Point, just in one year alone, $2.6 million increase in tax revenue. Why can we not get CFI gone? There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Please reach out and pull the cord and turn the light on and let's get this sucker out of here. Um, Carol Post said in August, we're happy to continue the conversation in the concept of, get, of, but it's unlikely the city will support this, and I don't want anyone spinning their wheels. She was talking about making a deal to get us a waterfront park to help pay, to help offset 
some of the costs that the developer who came up with the plan had. That developer has come to every single one of you and had a conversation with you about it and none of you said anything negative about it. So let's get off our butts and start talking about getting CFI in our rearview mirror as opposed to just playing games with it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carol Ann Bennett. I'm a lifelong Tampa resident. Many areas will fight tooth and nail to keep industrial out of their neighborhoods, but it's a big mistake to think that that's how SOG residents feel. They are portrayed as unreasonable anti-development people, but in fact, the opposite is true. SOG has always had commercial and industrial businesses. They like having them as neighbors and want more of them. Those businesses provide jobs that are minutes away. Growing up, my next door neighbor rode his bike to work at the Allied Fence Company. I used to ride my bike to work at the Big Moss Brothers on, Kent, on Gandhi Boulevard. Yes, the city needs housing, but I'd argue that a lot of our housing crisis is actually a good jobs crisis. Rattlesnake Point was a unique industrial site with both water and railroad access. The point provided good paying jobs for decades. It was foolish and short-sighted of the city to give that away. The city replaced those jobs with thousands of cars on a flooding peninsula with inadequate infrastructure that could turn deadly in an emergency evacuation. I've seen the data. While builders make big profits, the biggest profits are made by landowners when they get a change in land use and zoning. The Rattlesnake, o Rattlesnake Point landowners got the city to make those changes, and now they ask sky-high prices for their land. The comp plan has never allowed residential development abutting CFI. The applicant chose to speculate on a land deal that violates the comp plan. At every city council meeting, builders say you must approve something because it complies with the comp, it complies with the comp plan. Now they say you must approve something even though it violates the comp plan. So is the comp plan completely meaningless? I did not hear staff say this proposal meets the requirements of the comp plan. Homeland Security cited chlorine plants and their rail cars as desirable targets for terrorists. CFI is specifically listed as a top target in two independent reports I saw. Rail cars with tons of chlorine gas go through South Tampa every day. The railroads are so terrified of financially ruinous lawsuits they would stop chlor carrying chlorine if they could. Disasters don't make appointments. September 11th, 2000, 2001, wasn't circled in red on the nation's calendar. Is there any staff member who is specifically qualified to say these plans will keep residents safe? The sale of CFI could have been a done, done deal except the city has been unwilling to buy the taxpayers a six acre waterfront park. I need to be very clear on this. We are not asking the city to buy CFI. That is not on the table. Although the current mayor and the current city council did not make this mess, you are the ones who must clean it up. Please do the road improvements and the traffic light that are already the city's financial responsibility, ASAP, and take some of the new tax money from all these developments and buy a six acre waterfront park for Tampa citizens. Thank you. Who wants to speak on the side? Do we have anybody raised to speak on the side? Yes. Dean Strohmeyer's online. Hold on a second, we got somebody coming. Come on. Take your name. Okay, you can, I was just, I thought you were gonna take the virtual. No, we're gonna take you. Okay, that sounds great. Sorry. Um, good evening. My name is Jessica Eisterman. I am an attorney with Stearns Weaver Miller. We represent MAA, which is the property owner to the south of the property, um, who had a mixed use project approved late last year. This is, we do not represent CFI, we just represent another 
um, project in Rattlesnake Point. Sorry, I just climbed three flights of stairs. <laughs> okay, we are strongly in support of this project. I heard a lot of conversation earlier today about the risk of the chlorine trains, and I do, I thank you, um, Councilman Carlson, for pointing out that the trains do go through other highly populated areas, including downtown. They cross countless streets, and to my knowledge, there has been no rezoning request denied on the basis of possible chlorine exposure due to proximity to those rail lines. <sighs> okay, the project is consistent with the vision of Rattlesnake Point outlined in your comprehensive plan, which contemplates the transition of Rattlesnake Point from industrial to a mix of residential and commercial. The vision has existed since the 1980s when Gandhi Gateway policies were first adopted by the city. The waterfront amenities proposed by the project are a wonderful addition to the neighborhood and the South of Gandhi community as a whole. Further, the public boardwalk proposed along the water is an important step to enhancing connectivity and mixing residential and commercial, which is um, several policies of a comprehensive plan encourage that. And so we are here today to speak in support of this um, proposed Fludra settlement and um, your support of option one and option two. Thank you. You will speak on the side. How many have those three on that foot? We had three, two appeared, in, one did not show up, one appeared in person, and we have Gene Strohmeyer online. All right. Not there? Are you there, Jane? Hello? Hello? We got Can you, you here. Yay. Turn your okay. camera on. Um, share my webcam. There's the button. All right. Okay. Hello. Good evening. My you name is swear, you swear, you swear you in first, Jane. Please raise your right hand. Do you, do you swear for me to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me God, I got a Bible right here that'll tell you so. Anyway, uh, my name is Jean Strohmeyer, and I'm really shy. Y'all know that by now. I'm very shy about my, my beliefs and opinions, so I um, just thought I'd mention that. Okay, so I'm just listening to this, and, and you know, um, there's just so much to unravel here and they they want to do what they want to do abutting the cfi they the um and, and we already know what y'all are going to do anyway so it doesn't matter but i think the people need to be able to listen to what goes on and what we know that they don't know i mean i i'm really disappointed in in what's been going on with the city um with uh as you i, I y'all seen my um my email so i'm very disappointed i just throw that out there. So they're talking about evacuations. Okay, let me just go on back to the project. The evacuations, the evacuations they're referring to are for those units only. The evacuations for those units only will not be evacuated by those units. We're talking about evacuations by everybody down Port Tampa who can't get through because of the overbuilding on the, um, the northern end of our peninsula within the peninsula. That's the evacuations that are important. Those are the people that will be dying in their car, okay? Because, you know, they don't have helicopter back out, whatever. I don't know what these people will do that have the money to live there. But most people down here who live here and have built this city down here won't be able to get out. So um, we're talking about if there's an accidental um, release of toxicants from the chemicals. And the, the, the guy, the toxicologist, and, and, and they're saying it's like the slight chances. What are the chances? The chances are really slim. You want to know about slim chances? It was a really, really slim chance back last January when our farmer from down here in South Tampa got, got, got mulled and, and trampled by his own bull. Now, that just didn't happen. That doesn't happen. It was a slight chance when my brother was riding on the Pinellas Trail with his girlfriend on a tandem bike and some... Some guy um, 
hit another car, causing another car to roll over and flip and kill them both on the scene. That just, you just, again, you can't write that circle in a calendar. How about the, um, the incident where the, the one guy was speeding 100 miles an hour down the shore and killed a mother and a baby? What are the chances that mother and baby crossed at that exact time? Accidents and these in things do not happen by appointment. They happen when all things just come together. Now God's got His ways, and God will take us when it's one when, when it's when it's good and ready for us. And we just hope our souls are ready for that. Just saying. So um, with this whole situation, I just feel these people have been pushing. And pushing, and what happens, and what's happened, we saw it with Dean Felder, we see it with all the other ones that you guys said no to, they just sue, 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 sue. Well, um, you know, there has to come a point where somebody needs to put their big boy pants on and just say no, and just deal with it. You know, we have the what's right and what's wrong. There's only one right. There's only one right. And I hope you guys start righting the wrongs that are going on in this corrupt city that I've been seeing and, and other people are constantly coming to me and wondering why this city is corrupt. And I try to say, I try to say it's not y'all, but, but y'all can fix it. Anyway, have a great afternoon, evening, night. Been here all day. Peace out. Okay, anyone else, uh, Madam Clerk? That was it. That was it. All right, we'll go back to the applicant. Thank you again. Um, I want to just point out a few a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, quick responses. Um, condition 18 does require that we provide notice to tenants and prospective tenants. We added that at the request of um, Stephanie that we notify them that they where they're coming to potentially live. Um, uh, the Tampa Bay Local Planning Com uh, Committee um, through the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Commission has a hazardous emergency response plan that works with all the different counties in the Tampa Bay area and has specific provisions for Hillsborough County that relates to where all the different um, divisions of Hillsborough County and their requirements for mitigating and dealing with hazardous issues. Um, and, and CFI is one of the facilities within Hillsborough County that they that the county is required um, to have a plan for. So I can't speak to what Hillsborough County is actually doing, but there is um, the through the Tampa Bay Local Planning Committee through the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. That's where that local emergency management comes from. Um, um, MAA and other projects that have been approved here are similarly situated. They do not abut. And what we're talking about here is the 8.11.5, which talks about the fact that we abut. Um, it also talks about being unduly at risk. It doesn't say no risk. Obviously, we're not dealing with a situation of no risk. We're dealing with a situation where there is potentially some risk. But like any high risk, low probability situation, we are mitigating to a point where we are not unduly at risk. And what we have done is reach out to an expert, a scientist, a doctor who specializes in this to provide us with information and um, to get us to a point where we can be confident that we are providing mitigation that does not put our residents or the public nearby unduly at risk so that we are meeting the criteria of the comprehensive plan and with these accepted practices. Um, with regard to the rail cars, um, we confirmed that the rail line itself is 20 to 30 feet from the pavement, and the rail cars only go three nights a week, generally between midnight and 5 a.m., about 5 to 10 miles an hour along Tyson. So even, again, lowering that risk of any sort of event happening on Tyson, not even for just our property, but for any property that's along the road. 
Um, what I'd like to do is um, if I could get um, Dr. Noni back on the line and he wants to address some of the other um, issues uh, that came up. Um, sure. Can you hear me again? Yes. Yes. Great. Right. So I thought I would just touch on a couple of things and I just want to say I appreciate the comments from, from the public. Uh, part of my job is to try to help people understand risk and and I'm an expert in it, but not everybody is. And I, and I really hope that we can come, you know, provide some information that can give people some understanding as to what these issues are here. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about one of the, the council members had mentioned what happens to these tank cars in a hurricane. Uh, my company responded to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And the first place we responded to was a CSX rail yard in uh, New Orleans. And what we found when we got there was a lot of flooding. Uh, there was some damage to the rail and some of the tank or some of the rail cars involved. But what we found was no leaking chemicals to any significant uh, extent because of the way these rail cars are built. And one of the, the council members mentioned what happens if a tank car rolls over. Uh, the new 2009 regulations require the chlorine tank cars in particular and other hazardous materials that are carried in a similar type of tank car have more robust valve protection on top of the car. That's the only place the chemicals go is out of the top, uh, in, our, in and out of the valves on the top. And so since 2009, Hurricane Katrina was in 2005. Since 2009, um, we've seen a much more significant safety with these tank cars. And if they do roll over, which in the, the Bartow, Georgia derailment that I responded to personally, there were 13 tank cars piled up like, like you could imagine a, a kid's train set. If they decided to make a derailment, all the cars, cars were piled up on top of each other. That's what it looked like. And we didn't lose a single ounce of chlorine out of any of those tank cars. And they were rolled on their side. They were, some of them were standing up on the end. Um, they're, they're just very, very robust cars. And, and that was and, a high speed that was a high speed rail, not a 50. low speed at a facility kind of thing, correct? That's right. I believe it was a 50 mile an hour track. <clears throat> and so that gets that gets to another point I just want to make is that, you know, uh, CSX and the other class one railroads are required by law to transport hazardous materials. They do this across the country and they do it very, very safely. But when things go wrong, because it's large quantities of chemicals, it, it can be a, a large incident. Um, so, you know, I think the point being that there's not any way for a high speed accident to happen in the CFI facility. And the only way we could have a, a catastrophic release of an entire tank car of chlorine would have to be in a high speed incident. And so I just want to make it clear for everybody on the council and everybody in the, in the public that that's just that that's something that practically cannot happen in CFI. The issue that is more likely, although still very rare, is for there to be a small release from a valve or a hose that breaks or something like that. And I went through a lot of the procedures that CFI has in place to prevent those from being significant releases that could get outside of their fence. It, this is actually goes back to the, the, the county EPC when they did their uh, inspection uh, of the CFI facility in 2007. They wrote a report. They found that their procedures they had put in place to mitigate any chlorine releases were consistent with the order that had been put forth for them to comply with, and that uh, their engineers even said that what we've done here at CFI uh, will prevent or stop uh, from even happening in the first place significant releases of chlorine from our facility. And they haven't had any significant incidents since 2000. I'm just putting down that's the hazardous materials response plan. So I I I want to just point out that we we've we feel we've met our burden. We feel we've addressed every point. We've uh, responded to every issue. We've um, met every requirement. We we've the planning commission and the city staff uh, have, have confirmed that we're consistent. We've. Um, addressed you know every i think every concern and and um have support from mr steady as well 
So we would uh, respectfully request your support tonight. Thank you so much. What was just on the overhead? This is the Tampa Bay Hazardous Materials Emergency Response Plan that's done by the um, the local emergency planning committee that every part of Florida has. And um, every it provides an overview of the area. And then for each county, it provides information, uh, a little bit about the hazardous um, m m facilities in the area. And then it goes into detail on every single level of government and agency within that government including um, the fire department, the emergency management department, um, the board of county commissioners, the sheriff's office, the school board, and what role they all play in every single part of the uh, dealing with hazardous and emergency management of dangerous facilities. And CFI is one of the facilities that is part of that whole process. And so when, when Ms. Pointer is saying, what, what role does Tampa Fire play? This report is where that whole oversight comes from. And then it goes to Hillsborough County, which has its own process and it's divided up. And then each part of the city and the county have their own role to play. So that there is, not only is CFI having its own full national state regulatory process for safety, but also the local government has its own processes for ensuring that it's keeping its uh, citizens safe. And then in addition, as part of this process tonight, Woodfield is in implementing its own processes to add to its security for its own residents, which no other, you know, no other project in the city is really doing. The, the ones down the street aren't doing it. The Did ones, you, you know, yeah, along I the rail line aren't. So thank anyway, you. thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, our, our, the instructions we got from legal say that we have three options. We can, you all want to come back. I want to ask you a quick question. Um, sorry, <laughs> sorry to bring it back again. Um, but our instructions say that we, we can accept the magistrate's recommendation reject it, or, or we can suggest a modification. And so just to throw something out there before we close, legal's cut me off if you want, but um, it seems like you're pretty, you're pretty confident that this, um, this chlorine plant is gonna be shut down. Is there, is there any way you would consider making a condition on both options that, that it would be permanently closed before it would go forward so that the, the, um, this, everything would be approved but on the condition, on the additional condition that the plant be permanently closed. I'm, I'm hesitant to do that, unfortunately, because while we're hopeful, the process for that sale is highly confidential and we are not getting enough information to be able to confirm with sufficient knowledge that it's, <coughs> number one, for sure gonna happen, though we're hopeful, or it's gonna happen immediately, which we're hopeful, but we don't know. I mean, it could happen in a year, it could happen in a month or a week. We're, we really don't know, and unfortunately we've, as a, you know, a, a business, it's very difficult to, for them to kind of determine to proceed forward with such a unknown out there and just to put our whole business in this the hands of these third parties that aren't telling us what's happening even though we're sort of hopeful it it's it's just i think too risky to do that and so that's why we we expressly put forward these options of putting forward all this mitigation on the one hand we we obviously would like to and we're hopeful that they, they do proceed to sell because we don't want to spend all this extra money and all that extra work and effort. And honestly, I mean, we're having to resolve with the property to the west to get that secondary access. It's a huge pain to go through this process and we'd really prefer not to, but it's just too risky for us. Let me us. ask you another, if I could ask a follow-up question, um, and Lee will cut me off if, if I'm not interpreting this right, but. Is there something, if, if we made that a condition, is there something your client would want that we could, we, we could offer to put something in, but, but then take, put that condition in that would take something out? 
I don't think is I that understand. Appropriate or <laughs> Kate Wells, for the record, I, it, it sounds like the direction that you're going in is try to negotiate terms. So how do we? What is um, what does modify mean? How do we how do we negotiate a modification? We just we just are we just uni, unilaterally. Uh, you know, it's decide? it's an interesting option. It's it's an option that's in um, the Fludra Act. And it's not one that I have seen this council pursue. Um, most of the, since I've returned to the city, uh, when we have gone through that settlement process, the parties have been successful every time in presenting a settlement to this city council that has been found acceptable. And I think it's because the settlements really focus on the basis for the original denial. Um, a, a condition here, it, I think if based on the testimony you heard from their expert, if you felt additional mitigation was required um, with regard to alternative site plan number one, um, where chemical formulators remains in play, um, I think that would be the type of modification um, that would be appropriate to offer to the applicant to see if it's acceptable. But to suggest that if you do this, we do that, that type of negotiation, I don't believe that that is what the statute contemplated okay, in the way you. of the modification. Thank you. Thank Any you. other questions? We're close. We're close. Oh. It's just that. I'm sorry. This may be presumptuous, um, but I was told this is the right time. Um, because of the, like I explained, the, the issues that we have with the multiple parties as we're dealing with resolving all these things and ensuring that we can provide the access and, and the other options that we would ask just if, if you are um, uh, so good as to grant this approval tonight, we would just ask for extra time until second reading so that we can work on and just ensuring all these things are tied up and we've got everything resolved so we can continue forward and have an extended uh, second reading time. So, thank you. We'll close. So, my Ms. Ms. I, I just want to know what extra time means. I, I, oh. I, I'm just one. Like, like to the, to the, the words, following. I've never heard of that and, and this is fine. I, I'm not arguing Just to the following it. second reading, May 5th instead of end of April, just just a, an extra week or two. That's that's okay. all we're asking. I want to yes. make it what, two so. years from now. I yeah, mean, no, no. no. <laughs> no. Then, then we could wait for CFI to close, I think. But yeah, no. Mascots move close. Second. 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 Hopefully I do this right because I, you know, hear and saw alternatives one and two. Or can those be included together, or I choose one or the other? Both. Okay. So I make a motion to approve the special magistrate's recommendation. Um, after hearing all of this evidence and testimony over the last I don't know, two hours, um, I move that we accept the special magistrate's recommendation and proceed to implement the recommendation. Um, which would include the uh, alternatives uh, one and two, um, then that would be my, my first motion. I'll second it. Uh, we have one and two. So the first one is to accept the magistrate's recommendation and the report. Am I correct? Yes, sir. That's the one you signed on the floor now. Yes, sir. And the second it. Roll call. Gago. Yes. Vieira. Mr. Vieira. Vieira. Yes. I'm sorry. I was. Yes. Excuse me. Cedro. No. Miranda. Yes. Carlson. No. And Goods. Let me say this. Sometimes you have a double-edged sword. And what I see here, we have a double-edged sword. Because no matter what this council does, this is going to happen. The vote's already there, so my vote doesn't really matter at this point. But I will let people understand that uh, when you look at these situations, and it's unfortunate to our citizens sometimes. 
But I'm going to go ahead and vote yes for the project because I just know that uh, no matter what we do, it's, it's going to happen. So I'll go ahead and vote yes. Motion carried with Citro and Carlson voting no. I'm not going to do the second part. Second part. All right, so the second part to this is um, the motion to implement the special magistrate recommendation. So this would be to read the actual ordinance. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so I um, have an ordinance being presented for first reading consideration, an ordinance adopted pursuant to section 70-51 Florida statutes accepting a special magistrate's report and recommendation and rezoning property in the general vicinity of 5301 West Tyson Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in section two from zoning district classifications IH industrial heavy to PD plan development, residential multifamily retail sales, specialty goods, convenience goods, shoppers goods and marina providing an effective date. And uh, may I say then that uh, they, uh, this project is uh, consistent with land use policy 8.11 dash, I'm sorry, dot five. The applicant presented an alternative site plan that directly addresses the burden to demonstrate through design and accepted practices that the occupants of the proposed use shall not be unduly at risk from potential hazards associated with the abutting property. We heard from the doctor uh, as a, a toxicologist and the evidence that he and testimony that he provided um, the density proposed by the development does not exceed the density anticipated under the future land use category. We saw a reduction from when we heard this last time to a reduction in units and is comparable and compatible with the development pattern approved for other parcels of property on Rattlesnake Point. Uh, then compliance with land development code session 27-136, uh, purpose of the site plan control district. Um, the proposed development as shown on the site plan promotes or encourages development that is appropriate in location, character, and compatibility. We've seen that with the surrounding uh, parcels. Um, proposed use promotes the efficient and sustainable use of land and infrastructure. Uh, and this also includes uh, all waivers uh, in compliance with section 27-1394. And I'll throw in there um, the extra time for second reading that was uh, requested in order to work out any other kinks and, and tie up loose ends for May 5th instead of the traditional uh, next council meeting that we have. That's my motion. Yes, sir. And uh, the revision sheet, I believe, exists between first and second reading. Yes, sir, and the revision sheet, and that would complete my motion. OK, there, uh, just to, for clarity, the design of the proposed development is unique and therefore in need of waivers. We've heard all the testimony and the, um, the uh, mediation in between to get to this point. The requested waiver will not substantially interfere with or injure the rights of others whose property would be affected by the waiver. We've heard all the evidence there. Uh, again, we don't know what's gonna happen with chemical formulators. Um, you know, could happen next month, could happen next year. Uh, we don't know because as is, has already been mentioned that's uh, confidential so we don't know what's going to happen perhaps this um, acts as the catalyst for um, you know movement on that and I think I've covered everything yep Second. same with Mr. Randa discussion thank you Mr. Chair if I can me uh, the last time we heard this case my decision was based on the entrance and exit with the rail there now, Mr. Shelby, if I overstep my bounds, please tell me. Stop. Years ago, this was industrial. You had Meissner Marina was out there, Meissner Marine, Underwriters Laboratory, and other industrial places. But none of them had the effect that this chlorine plant had. I am not against developing Rattlesnake Point. But my concern still is that chlorine plant. Life would be so much easier if it wasn't there. So I want you to understand I'm not against the development. My concerns are the effects that that plant may be have on the residents around it. And therefore, that's the basis of my vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, no, just just um, just a reminder, Council, um, and I've reviewed Robert's rules on this. Uh, discussion on the motion should take place before the vote, and if you can, Council, I'd appreciate it for future if you could just not make comments during the vote and stop the process during the vote. Say what you need to say, and then just take the vote in in sequence, please. That's thank just you, thank you. All right, take the vote. Citro? No. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? No. Maniscaco? Yes. Vieira? Vieira? Sorry, yes. Sorry. And, and goes. Yep. Motion carried with Citra and Carlson voted no. Second reading and adoption will be held May, May 5th, 2022 at 9 30 a.m. Six. Thanks so much, Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. Agenda item number six, case REZ 21-115. This further uh, proposed rezoning at 1502 North Nebraska Avenue, 1314, 1312. Zane, we can't hear you. I don't know if that's CTT you bought or we can't hear you. All right, try it again. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Just barely. Thanks so much. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. Going over agenda item number six, case REZ 21 115. This vote for the proposed rezoning at 1502 North Nebraska Avenue, 1314, 1312, 1310, 1308, 1306, 1304, 1302, and 1218 East K Street, as well as 801, 803, 805, 807, 809, and 811 East 3rd Avenue. Proposed rezoning from RM16 and YC5 to PD, residential single family attached and business professional office. I now pass it along to Jennifer Malone of the Planning Commission. Good evening. Good evening, Council. Jennifer Malone with your Planning Commission. I will share my screen whenever I have permission. As Zane stated before, this is REZ 21115. Um, we're in the Central Tampa Planning District within the Central Park Urban Village. Um, so we're located on Nebraska Avenue. I understand this has come before you before, so I will be brief in the aerial. I think um, everybody probably has a pretty good understanding of where this is and the Encore development uh, is to the south and Tampa Park Apartments to the east of the site. Um, the future land use is urban mixed use 60. To the south of the site, we have regional mixed use 100 and to the east is community mixed use 35. The um, the subject site is located within a mixed use corridor. Um, I understand this was before council previously. Um, and I just want to state for the record that between the last site plan and the site plan that the planning commission reviewed um, to write the report that is in front of you today, um, we agreed we were um, supportive of the changes that the applicant has made, um, primarily adding building entrances are oriented towards um, and they connect to the sidewalk along North Nebraska Avenue. We found that this was consistent with the mixed use centers and corridors policies and that the pedestrians can access transit and safely navigate throughout the site. Um, we also find that this consistent, um, the, the progress of plan encourages new housing on vacant or underutilized parcels to continue to ensure that an adequate supply of housing is available to meet the needs of Tampa's present and growing population. This will provide those additional housing choices. Um, so again, this promotes a residential infill development pattern consistent with the compact city form strategy. And we are, um, planning commission is supportive and finds the revised site plan with those pedestrian entrances um, that the applicant has added uh, consistent with the comprehensive plan. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Anything from Ms. Malone? All right. Back to you, Zane. If you can lift your uh, microphone up, up to your mouth a little bit, Zane, and say what the problem is. Can you hear me pretty well? A little bit better now. Thanks so much. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination, going over case REZ 21 115. The applicant is and representative is Mark Bentley. Proposed rezone from YC5 and RM16 to PD, Planned Development Residential, Single Family Attached, and Business Professional Office 
is requesting eight waivers, um, mostly to do with transportation engineering and also natural resources. The first waiver is to request to allow commercial traffic access to a local street, East Third Avenue, North Mitchell Avenue, and East K Street. The second waiver to request to allow the reduction in all width from 24 feet to 22 feet. The third waiver to request to reduce the North Nebraska Avenue special street setback of 54 feet to 42 feet for, for any building or structure on the property. The special street setback line is measured from the center line of the existing right of way. The fourth waiver being proposed is to reduce the required parking from 114 spaces to 96 spaces. This is a 16% reduction. The fifth waiver being proposed is to request to reduce the required 50% retention for a non-wooded lot over one acre to 19% retention. Sixth waiver being proposed is to request to remove one non-hazardous Grand Laurel Oak uh, of 33 inches DBH and rated C6. Seventh waiver to request to reduce the required 300 square, 350 square feet of green space per unit to 313 square feet. The reduction of green space is subject to the landscape and lieu fees that will be determined at the time of permitting. And the last eighth waiver is to request to reduce the required eight foot vehicular use area landscape buffer to zero feet along Third Avenue. I will come to the aerial of the, uh, the parcel as you see outlined here in red. Now to the north and to the west, you will have uh, PD zoning. And these are um, office uses. To the north, you'll have the GTE building and to the west, you'll have the Feeding Ministries building. If you come here to the east, you will see a, uh, the library, the Robert Saunders Library, which is zoned CG. And to the south, you will have a church, and also you will have the Encore uh, residential multifamily buildings here to the south, and those are zoned RM24. Now, the development, as I go to the site plan, the development is of the properties for 40 residential single family attached and business professional office uses. The subject property contains a lot area of 155,708 square feet and is located along North Nebraska Avenue, North Governor Street, and East K Street. The present use of the land is vacant and also commercial building. The existing commercial space is 6,250 square feet and the proposed residential space is 35,308 square feet. As stated in the waivers, the um, total required parking is 114 spaces and the applicant is providing 96, so asking for a waiver of 16% reduction. Vehicular access to the site comes off of East K Street. As I went on the site, you can see the vacant portion and also you can see that um, Robert Saunders Library to the northeast of the site. As you'll see, the office space of Feeding Ministries to the west. To the south of the site, you'll see the Encore uh, residential multifamily building. And to the east of the site, you'll see more of the library and also um, county owned space. Development review and compliance staff has reviewed the application and finds the overall request inconsistent with the City of Tampa Land Development Code. This is due to the transportation planning and natural resources waivers. Modifications to the site plan must be completed by the applicant between first and second reading of ordinances as stated on the revision sheet. Please be aware that even with these changes to the site plan, the case will still be found overall inconsistent. Thank you. I'm here for any questions. And also, I have my transportation engineering staff and also natural resources staff on standby. Any questions for Zane? All right. We'll hear from the applicant. Good evening, Council. My name is Michael Mintzberg, uh, 1925 East 6th Avenue, Tampa, Florida. I have been sworn in. Um, 
Our company site development has probably been based in Ybor for over 10 years and have added value to the community with past new construction and historic renovation projects. I want to point out the location of this project is sandwiched between three large-scale developments, uh, the GT Credit Union, Gasworks, and Encore. Uh, Encore and Gasworks uh, have, have been planned as primarily rental developments and uh, uh, you know, different from ours, which is uh, opportunity to create home ownership. There are some really important benefits to this project. As I mentioned, it creates a significant opportunity for home ownership. There is very little home ownership in Ybor City, which is an important part to a live, work, play neighborhood. Secondly, we are repositioning a 100-year-old building in terrible shape that has been vacant for over 20 years. This is not required, but being sensitive to the adjacent historic district is consistent with the comprehensive plan and is important to the character of the community and to us. Additionally, we have coordinated with our design team to retain three grand trees and help keep the tree canopy. Lastly, this improves vacant land that right now is not a safe pedestrian pathway and it creates connectivity between the large scale projects currently there. There are some unique hardships that create the need for a planned development here. This is a very unusual narrow block, uh, and also we're being penalized for retaining the 100-year-old structure and developing a mixed-use project. It's one of those quirky issues in the code that contradicts the comp plan encouraging mixed uses within a mixed-use category. The majority of the property also has never been developed, which has resulted in some significant trees that, have that we have worked hard to design around. I want to point out how close this is to the uh, Ybor Historic District. That red line is the um, local historic district line. Uh, and if we were within there, we would have you know, a, a much more lenient uh, zoning code and reduce the need for waivers. This is an aerial of the 100-year-old uh, uh, building that sits there today. Uh, as you can see, it's right on the property line. And two of our, two of our waivers, um, just to point out there, one is uh, getting vehicular access on the uh, commercial corridor of Nebraska is impossible because the building takes all of that up. And secondly, uh, it would be meeting the setback. I mean, the building is already there. So you know, the, we would lose, lose an important character of the community to meet those requirements. And frankly, it would make more economic sense for me if I would take that building down. I could put six more units there which would make more money, but I think it's important to the project and to the neighborhood. Just a, this is a photo of the current condition of the property at, at the bottom, and then a rendering of uh, what we plan to do to really bring it back to its, its uh, original glory. So the purpose of this aerial is to show you how unusually narrow this, this uh, block is. It's really a leftover piece of the GTE um, development there, which is really what's created this hardship for us. Um, it's about a third of the width of the block to the south, uh, which is just makes it incredibly hard to develop and, and meet all the code requirements. Uh, I also want to point out that the city uh, allowed GTE to vacate Third Avenue here and GT got all of that land, and this road here was uh, made a private access to them. So it limited our access options, uh, again, creating a hardship for us on the development. As a local developer, we are really excited to be part of the Ebor uh, Renaissance and add value to our community. And I just want to say thank you and hand it over to our council, Mark Bentley. I'd uh, like for council to receive and file their letters in support in Mike's presentation. Good evening, council. My name is
is Mark Bentley, 401 East Jackson Street, Tampa, 33602. Uh, represent Mike's company, Site Development. Um, you know, <clears throat> notwithstanding the overall finding of inconsistency by staff, if you look at the staff report on paragraph two, when they look through the criteria for the purpose of a PD, it says uh, the proposed use of residential single family attached homes and business professional offices compatible with the surrounding area. Then they identify some of the uses. So the real challenge here is that you have these codes in the city of Tampa that are t typically used or used often in some like a sur suburban environment like Tampa Palms or Hunter's Green where uh, the code requires say 350 square feet of green space for a unit. So you know to build a big apartment project in Hunter's Green is not that's not much of a challenge but when you get these small like urban infill sites and in try and apply all these different codes it's very difficult to do this with all these constraints so that's where the waivers come in and you'll see that notwithstanding the number we've re reduced those and you'll understand the rationale like I think Mike was trying to tell you here uh, the first thing I want to point out like Mike said here can you go to the um, there we go this is Third Avenue. It used to go all the way down here to the west over to Governor, and that got vacated by GTE. So that road's gone. And then this became private access for GTE. So now instead of having roads to build up against, the road has to be created internally to the project. Okay? So that's an obstacle there. I mean, that just creates kind of a hardship. Now, this, this building Mike had mentioned it's roughly 6,000 square feet. And <clears throat> the way your code is, is that it says that there's a Nebraska Avenue setback of 54 feet. Okay, and that was enacted a long time ago. And, <clears throat> but this building was built at 42 feet. So now we need a waiver of 12 feet just to maintain this semi-historic building. Um, and you can see what Mike intends to do with the building. I think he showed you that. So to get to this building, and here's the site plan, you have to come in from a residential street. So there's another waiver, okay? So these little things start piling up, notwithstanding the fact that these are legal nonconformities, okay? And now with respect to the parking, <clears throat> originally this was gonna, the, the ratio was higher last last time around. But as of the last two days, we've worked it out with the city where the city said professional and business office only has a ratio of one space per thousand. So the overall project, Mike could have built 214 units here and he's building 14, 40 plus 6,000 square feet he's gonna rehab. <clears throat> so the parking required is 90 for the residential and six spaces for this building the old building. So we have 96 spaces on site. We don't need a parking waiver anymore. That waiver is gone, okay? And I'd also like to point out to council that this is public right away. I'm pointing to, if you can see it, eh, it's kind of tough, here you go. And there's 10 spaces here. Now those are in the public right away and we can't count those toward our required parking under the code, okay? But realistically, who's gonna use those 10 spaces? So now we have another 10, so now we have 116 spaces. So parking really isn't an issue. Now with respect to the other waiver, there is a <clears throat> requirement for open space, as I mentioned, it's 350 square feet per unit, and we're providing 313. Last time we were here a few weeks ago, we had 304, so now we're up to 90% which is pretty darn good for an urban infill project. So, uh, and then I'll tell you how we offset that. <clears throat> also, we're saving three grand trees, so we actually have a credit in the credit bank, which is very unusual for these projects being presented to city council. Um, also, with the shortage of the square footage in terms of the green space, the, three, the 313 versus 350 required by code, we're paying a fee in lieu into the, the the city's fund. We also exceed the 20% VUA by providing 6,120 square feet when only 3,900 square feet are required. 
So we're pr providing 2,200 more square feet of vehicle use area. That's 35% more than required by the code. So that 2,000 offsets the, I guess, roughly 2,000 or 1,800 were short on the overall green space. So I think uh, because of the uniqueness of the situation, that offsets that. I spoke with the president of St. Peter Claver yesterday, and um, she has no problem with it. We have a lot of support from the community. Um, the, as Mike mentioned, we're just on the fringe of the historic district. We had sent it over to um, Historic Preservation to take a look at it, and they had no objections to. And actually, they're very enthused about the fact that here's someone ready to, you know, willing to step up to the plate and rehab one of these old buildings without someone putting a gun to his head. You know, he's doing that because that's what Mike does in Ybor City. If you've seen any of his projects, so I think we whittled down the waivers to the extent we reasonably could. I think there's a hardship here, the uniqueness of the property, and these are the kind of projects that I think the city really. It creates a lot of diversity, and unlike that big map Mike shows you with gas works and everything, these are fee simple homes. People are going to own their home here. Most of those homes are, those projects you're seeing are rental projects, those big projects in Ybor City. So I think that's a very important element to the project as well. So we've done everything we can. You know, we kept the density down. We didn't try and take advantage of that. Um, some of these waivers seem a little bit, I mean, you know, the code is what it is, but telling us we need a waiver from a, a street setback when that building's been there for 96 years, you know, because you guys just happened to change your code after that building was there. It, you know, it makes it sound like, hey, these guys are coming in asking for the world here, but really, as you can see, that's not the point. So if you have any questions, um, I'll gladly attempt to answer them, but thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Any questions, Mr. Bentley? Did you, Mr. Bentley, did you show elevations besides the historic building? Did I miss them? Um, Zane has them. That's okay. Thank you. No, I've, I've got a set in the file, Mr. Carlson. While you guys are talking, I could pull them out probably. That's cool. I was, I was more curious than anything. Thank you. Good, sir. You want to You know, I don't know what that building was, <laughs> but a gentleman I knew would tell me that he would sit on Nebraska Avenue with his friend in the 30s because all the big houses were on Nebraska and watch all the fancy cars, like Duesenbergs and, you know, cars that are in museums now, but I don't know what that building was. But the funeral home was to the, the was north, right? That was Lord Fernandez. Lord no, to Fernandez. the north. It didn't turn into Franklin. Right, right. It didn't turn into Franklin years ago. Franklin, yeah. I don't know if it's back there. showing the elevation, okay. thank you. <coughs> That's great. These are pretty bare bones, but you can see here, three story. The intent of the architecture is to have a simple, authentic Ybor City design to it, which was, you know, more monolithic uh, storefronts, Things of that nature. You can see the columns and everything they tried to replicate, kind of like a Seventh Avenue. Thing. Exactly. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Any other questions, Mr. Bailey? All right. Anybody in the public speaking to that? Anyone else speak on this item? Anyone register? No registered speakers for this item. Move close. So moved. Second. Who want Mrs. Uh, Moran to second one, Mr. Maniscalco? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion. Aye. Is that Mr. Beer? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. uh, Mr. Moran? I'll take it, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Do you want me to read it, sir? Uh, we'll go, we'll go oh, Mr. Moran, and you'll get the next one. All right. Move file number 6REZ21-115. Yes, uh, ordinance being for substitute ordinance uh, being presented for first reading consideration. Ordinance resulting.
Neighboring property in the general vicinity of 1502 North Nebraska Avenue and 1218, 1302, 1304, 1306, 1308, 1310, 1312, 1314, East K Street, and 801, 803, 805, 807, 809, and 811, East 3rd Avenue, in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in Section 1 from Zoning District Classification, RM16, Residential Multifamily to YC, Ybor City, <coughs> a historic district, to PD, <coughs> residential single family attached, and business professional office providing an effective date. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Mascalco. Roll call. Vieira. Mr. Is he on yes. screen? I'm sorry. And yes. yes. Oh, and sorry, the revision sheet, yeah, please. Yes. Okay. Can, yes, if you can, can you see me? No, we can't yet. Not on screen. Oh, um. If we can go to the monitor. Can, you guys can't see me? Our monitor's not working. If we can ask the uh, CTV, t CTTV to switch over to be able to see you, that would be there great. There he is. There he is. Yes. All right. Citro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. And Goods? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on April 21st, 2022 at 9.30 a.m. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. On item number seven, um, I need to uh, recuse myself, um, and I'd like to, <coughs> with your permission, make a motion to accept my form so 8B. The nature of my conflict is that the company by whom I'm retained does business with the school board of Hillsborough County on matters not related to this application. <coughs> Moved by Mr. Mascalco. Second. 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 Wow. All right, item number seven. Yes, sir. Thank you, Stane. Development coordination. Case number seven, uh, case SU2 21 03. This is a request for a special use two for a school at the location 4210 West Bay Villa Avenue. I'll now pass it along to Jennifer Malone of the Planning Commission. Good evening, Council. Jennifer Malone again with your Planning Commission. The same said, this is SU 22103. It's in the South Tampa Planning District. And um, here's an aerial of the subject site. So as you can see, it's located east of South Manhattan Avenue. Um, there's um, commercial uses located along South Manhattan Avenue, but the predominant pattern in this area is single family detached. So we'll see that reflected um, pretty accurately on the future land use map. So there's the community mixed use 35 along South Manhattan Avenue where the commercial uses are. And then the residential 10 in the neighborhood, which is where the single family detached uses um, are located. The subject site itself has a future land use of public semi-public. The public semi-public designation does not have density or intensity. Instead, it is guided by the surrounding development pattern when the Planning Commission staff reviewed this request, we took um, a sample of, of other commercial and public uses in the area and determined the average FAR um, within the surrounding area to see if this would be compatible. So the applicant is proposing an FAR of 0 0.26. And then um, the Planning Commission analysis found that um, seven sample sites in the surrounding area for non-residential uses was developed in an FAR of 0.17. Um, so we did find that the proposed FAR of 0.26 would be compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. Um, we also found that the, and the comprehensive plan also encourages the placement of schools and other public facilities and neighborhoods to serve as community vocal points through effective school facility development and design and siting standards to ensure that public facilities are compatible with the surrounding development pattern. So the planning commission um, did find that this was consistent with those policies. And we found that the school um, was providing um, the buffering required and that the, the buffering and the screening to the residential uses would be were, would be consistent with those policies. Um, so given the design features, Planning Commission staff finds that the request will be developed in a manner that is sensitive and compatible with the surrounding neighborhood and consistent with that underlying public and public future land use designation. So that concludes my presentation, but I'm available for questions. Thank you. Any of Ms. Malone? All right, being none, we'll go back to Zane. 
Thanks so much. Zanu Hussain, Development Coordination, case SU221-03. The applicant is a school board of Hillsborough County, represented by Julia Mandel at the location 4210 West uh, West Bay Villa Avenue. Currently zoned RS60, residential single family, and proposed to a special use of a school. One waiver is being requested. Section 27-132 says uh, to allow access to a local street. These local streets are South Coolidge Avenue, West Bay Villa Avenue, and South Lois Avenue is the one waiver requested. Now, I would like to point out that the applicant is proposing a max height of 50 feet, which is surpassing the, um, the height of RS-60. But the applicant does not need a waiver for this as per section 27-132F of the code, which states a school may be constructed in excess of the height limitations of the zoning district in which it is located, provided the applicant can demonstrate that the height of the school does not adversely affect the adjoining and nearby properties. In determining whether height has an adverse effect, the relations of the school to the surrounding neighborhood, including yards, distance from the streets, and distance from existing residential dwellings and other structures shall be considered. Other special conditions may also be established to ensure the compatibility of the height of the school with the surrounding residential neighborhood. And that's from 27-132F of the zoning code. Upon that, staff finds this height acceptable due to the location of the buildings and the setbacks from the property lines, as I will show you on the site plan. Moving along to the overhead aerial, you'll see the property here outlined in red, fronting West Bay Villa uh, Avenue, South Coolidge Avenue, and also South Lois Avenue. The Lot has approximately 563,832 square feet or 12.944 acres. The proposed student population is approximately 1,800 students with 120 staff members. The proposed development will include five buildings for a total building square footage of 151,433 square feet. Now, abutting the neighborhood, uh, I'm sorry, abutting the school, is residential 60 to the north, to the east, and to the south. To the west, you will have a, um, a youth center here called the PrEP, and also you will have a library here also to the west, and that is the uh, Jan Platt Library. The proposed request requires 100, 135 parking spaces, as you see the overhead view of the site. 135 parking spaces uh, are required and a total of 151 parking spaces are being provided. As we look at the elevations of the proposed buildings. As I went out to the site, you can see what is currently as a Manhattan Center, um, which is currently uh, used for only staff only for educational exercises. As you see the site, also the south, and you can also look, if you look down, you'll see the prep. And also if you look, you'll see the uh, Jan Platt Library to the west of the site. To the south of the site and north of the site, you'll see that residential single family. And also to the east of the site and northeast of the site, you have that residential single family uh, along the streets. Development review and compliance staff has reviewed the application and finds the overall request consistent with the City of Tampa Land Development Code. Now, modifications to the site plan must be completed between first and second reading, if approved, as stated on the revision sheet. I'm here for any questions if needed. Zane, what school is there now? Uh, right now, it is a um, right now it is just a training facility. It's called the Manhattan Center. It's uh, only as per the uh, applicant. And uh, research from our side is uh, just a training facility for staff members only. That used to be a school. I can't think of the name of that. Any questions for uh, Zane? All right, Ms. Mandel. Good evening, Council. Julia Mandel, uh, uh, law firm of Gray Robinson, 401 East Jackson Street, Tampa, Florida. I'm here on behalf of the school board. With me is Renee Camden, who is the manager of planning and siting with uh, the school district. She is attending virtually, so I, and I saw her up there, so 
she's available for, for any questions that you may have. I think uh, Zane did a nice job explaining what the project is, and, and um, Mr. Gooch, you are correct. This used to be a school, but now it is serving as an administrative building for the school board. They, they are redeveloping this site in order to provide for a K through eight school. Uh, in that neighborhood, we're you know we're getting to a place where schools, uh, uh, especially with the development in South Tampa, are starting to have some crowding problems. So this is always intended to be and is what we intend to do to to create a, a new school uh, in this location. Um, as Sane said, it's about it's approximately 13 acres, just under 13 acres right now. As I said, it's an administrative building. There's also some. Um, uh, fields that are used uh, by, I think it's Tampa Prep for the purposes of, of their um, sports activities. Uh, we did have a neighborhood meeting regarding this school. Um, I did not attend it, but Renee did. And from what our conversation was, uh, it seemed it was an overall positive for this to, to develop in this way as a school in this neighborhood. Some of the issues that did come up from what I understand is related to sidewalks, and we are providing sidewalks on all four corners of the site. Um, there was also some conversation and discussions regarding stormwater in those discussions. Um, we will, as we're required to, uh, maintain all of our stormwater on site. Um, we're putting in box culverts and doing other uh, improvements in order to ensure stormwater needs are met. However, there has been some discussions with the city uh, that are ongoing. Nothing's been finalized in order to be able to also use our site and oversize some of our facilities for a bigger stormwater project in the area. That's not in front of you, but I just thought um, you should know that those conversations are, in, uh, are occurring. In addition, as I said, there are some sports fields on there as of now. That being said, all lighting for any uh, uh, future uh, sports fields will be directed inward and will be shielded. There will also be uh, landscape buffers around, around um, uh, in proximity to the residential um, uses that exist now, that the single family residential that will help to buffer this. We really do think this is a, a good amenity for the neighborhood. It helps to ensure that we're uh, uh, providing uh, uh, schools for uh, the influx of residents that are coming throughout this city, but specifically in this area. Um, the only other thing I will say is that as it relates to the waiver, you are required to locate your schools per code on um, collector arterial roadways, but you also have within your comprehensive plan the interest in having schools in neighborhoods. So we are asking for a waiver to allow access onto local roads, but obviously in this case, you, that's where you want your schools, especially a K through eight school, so that you can have opportunities for kids to walk to school and, and be not on larger roadways. Um, one other thing just that I'll mention is all of our queuing will be on site and I have kids, I've been in queue lines and it is definitely better when you can get those off the roadway. So redeveloping this site will allow for that. I'm available for any additional questions. I don't know if Renee has any additional comments, but um, that's uh, pretty much uh, my presentation for this time. Thank you. Any questions, Ms. Mandel? All right, being none, anybody from the public to speak on the side? We have one have one. Yes, we have one. Gene Strohmeyer. All right, we got Gene there. She in the queue, Madison. Gene, are you there? Move the closed segment, Mr. Miranda. All in favor? All right. Any opposed? Aye. Mr. Vieira. Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. Uh, my pleasure here. to move an ordinance. Oh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, my pleasure to move an ordinance being presented for first reading consideration. An ordinance approving a special use permit SU2, approving the school in, the, in an RS60 residential single family zoning district in the general vicinity of 4210 West Bay Villa. Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more, and is more particularly described in section one hereof, providing an effective date. Say by Mr. Miranda, roll call. Cedro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Maniscaco? Yes. Vieira? Yes. 
And goods. Yes. Motion carried. Calls and abstaining. Second reading and adoption will be held on April 21st, 2022 at 9.30 a.m. All right. Item number eight, Zane. Thanks so much, sir. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. Agenda item number eight, case AB2-22-05. This is requesting a special use two for a small venue beer, wine, and liquor consumption on premises and package sales off premises consumption. Generally located at 520 East Fort Nebraska Avenue. Can I please have a uh, control of the screen? You have control saying. Great. Can you see my screen? <clears throat> no. Not yet, Zane. Not yet. Let's try this again. How about now? No, sir. All right. Third time's the charm? All right, we got to just blow it up for us. Thank you so much. All right. The applicant is King State Coffee, LLC, represented by Tyler Hudson. Now, there's an active AB sales permit here, AB218-07, and this is for small venue beer and wine. Now, the proposed AB sales uh, permit is AB2-22-05, which will be small venue, beer, wine, and additional liquor. The square footage for the AB sales will be the same, uh, 1,696 square feet indoors, 941 square feet outdoors for a total of 2,637 square feet. The parking provided is 27 parking spaces. Now, this was uh, approved in AB2-18-07 which goes from 33 parking spaces required to 27. So that's been approved uh, in the past. For the hours of operation, the hours of operation, the uh, applicant um, as of this week told me that they would like to have the hours of op operation the same as it currently is. Uh, so instead of being consistent with chapter 14, they're requesting from 7 a.m. to 1 a.m. seven days per week. Now, no alcohol sales will be done prior to 11 a.m. on Sundays and closing time can be extended to 2 a.m. six times per calendar year. The applicant is to notify the zoning administrator of the proposed dates in writing annually by January 15th each year. So as per learning this this week from the applicant, uh, changes to site plan must be made between first and second reading on the sales hours. There are no waivers being requested here and no AB sales establishments within 250 feet. If you come over here uh, to the aerial view, you'll see the site outlined here in red. Now, if you look at the site, you'll have residential uh, surrounding the site, as well as 275 running north and south over to the east. If we go to the overhead view of the site plan, you'll see where the structure is, the parking, and then the residential surrounding the uh, parcel. East for Nebraska Avenue is where access to the site is. As you see the elevations to the site, as it currently stands. And when I went out of the site, I took more additional pictures of the site. You'll see the structure. You'll see the west of the site, you'll see the residential homes. You'll see to the east of the site, you have 275 running up and down. To the south of the site, residential single family homes. And to the north of the site, uh, above, uh, among, over the fence, you'll see residential single family homes. The development review and compliance staff has reviewed this application and finds it consistent with the city of Tampa code of ordinances. Now, minor corrections to the site plan are needed between the first and second reading. Everything else? I'm here for any questions. Zane, you said there's no alcohol being served within 250 feet at that, at that site? Correct. There is an AB sales establishment uh, to the west, but that is uh, farther than 250 feet. Yeah, I know, but I'm, there's, 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 there's two D corner stores there. Uh, okay, all right. It sell beer and wine. And they'll sell beer and wine. Correct. These were taken into account, uh, but they are beyond 250 feet into citizen separation. 
Really? Hmm. Okay, all right. Any questions for Zane? We have some concerns. Uh, yeah, Mr. Hudson, how you doing, sir? Good evening, gentlemen. Right. Tyler Hudson, 400 North Ashley Drive. Um, if I could use the screen here, CCTV would let me. Come on, Tyler, I need you to operate that thing. Yeah, I got, I got a John Madden thing. I can draw pictures on it. <laughs> All right, can we see that? Yes, sir. All right. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here for this one in particular. I start uh, most of my mornings at this establishment. I live three blocks away. My, my kids love the biscuits that they serve, and we want to make a very slight change to their wet zoning. That's what we're here to talk about. Zane did a great job running through what's already approved in the very minor change we're making. So I just want to emphasize a couple of those points. This is right at the intersection of Florida, Nebraska, and T75, really kind of in the heart of Tampa Heights. Tyler, we know you, but you got to give your name, too. Oh, I thought I did it at the beginning. Tyler Hudson, 400 <laughs> North Ashley Drive, for the record. Uh, again, this was originally approved back in April of 2018. The, the only change we're making is the, the ability to serve uh, mixed drinks, cocktails, liquor. So it, just like a special restaurant. Uh, we're not creating a liquor store right now. We can sell unlimited amounts of beer and wine uh, along with the coffee, which is you know, certainly the biggest seller for King State. King State was, uh, worth noting, named uh, in Food and Wine Magazine one of the 10 best coffee shops in the United States. And it's here in our very own Tampa Heights. As the food and beverage programs evolved, it, it's, it's in some ways more akin to a restaurant. So just like you go to Spain restaurant downtown, they're mostly serving food, they're mostly serving non-alcoholic um, beverages, um, but they do have the ability to serve beer, wine, and liquor as well. That's all we're asking for here. Um, Zane alluded to this, we are not adding any waivers, no new sales area, no change in operating hours. That is a change we will make between first and second reading. The site plan that's before you right now uh, incorrectly has chapter 14 hours. That is not our intent. Also on amplified sound, there was a restriction um, in the original site plan. It's in this current site plan that I'll talk about in one second. There you can see the operating hours, um, seven to one, no alcohol sales before 11 with a, a six times a year, the ability to extend for just one hour. Uh, on noise, so this is what the current note reads and we have no intent to change it. Um, no amplified sound after 10 p.m. Sunday to Thursday, nothing after 11 on the weekends. Uh, this is across from, um, or it's, it's in the middle of a residential community and as you'll hear about in a little bit, um, King State uh, prides itself on being an excellent neighbor and, and, as, and we're really proud to have the support of the Civic Association as evidence of that. You may have driven by this, that's, uh, that's what it looks like, that's certainly not changing. Uh, very proud to have the support of the Tampa Heights Civic Association. There, uh, there are a few letters of uh, support in the record as well. Uh, I will admit when I read through the letters today, um, one name stood out because it's uh, my wife's name and our address. Uh, so I, I hope you don't put uh, too much objectivity into her letter, but just don't tell her I said that. She can be fair and impartial. She, th I, she, she definitely can't be. Her name's Grace Northern, but that, uh, that, uh, that is my house uh, that's in that letter. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. We have um, some support here in the room, but we're going to be cognizant of your time and our fellow traveler on tonight's agenda and keep it very brief. I, I, didn't, I didn't know they sell food there. I thought there was just, uh, you know, just uh, craft or beer or something. Great food, great food. The only concern I have, and yet, I want to make sure you clear this up, you, you know that area well. I, I, two of my best friends live on that street on Florida Brass. Mm -hmm. And my, my uncle used to live right across the street in the corner house that always the, the cars run up into. The northeast corner of the interstate in Florida Brass? Oh, right there. I've seen your car out front. So my uncle used to live there for a long, long time. And uh, cars used to go up there all the time, or they go across the street and run the, uh, now they got a light up there now, so. Uh, very familiar with that. It used to be an old mechanic gas station many years ago. But the area, and the area is changing because we were able to demolish an eyesore a couple of weeks ago uh, with our homeless population. And that's why it talked about beer and wine and liquor. 
it's been a problem. And two blocks, two boys north, you know, we have the corner store there. We have a hangout spot. And when I hear liquor, it's a different bell that goes because I'm not, I'm not a proponent of having liquor stores in communities a lot of times because it brings on blight and it brings on problems. But you could tell me what are we doing again with, with the liquor and kind of make sure that there's no package store, there's no selling or leaving. Give me the idea of that. Sure. So as this council sees a lot of these wet zonings, there, there's the, the local city component, the special use too, that's the wet zoning, which stays with the land. Then there's the state component too. You have to unlock that wet zoning with a state license. So right now you can buy and consume on premises and off premises beer and wine. If this gets approved, you're also going to be able to have a cocktail that has liquor in it on premises. There's there's no state license that we're getting or can get based on this wet zoning we're getting to, to sell liquor to go. There's no ability. Under state law, because of COVID, there is ability for special restaurants in certain circumstances to do the, the cocktails to get, and that was really popular during COVID. But this is not going to be a package store for liquor. Uh, King State's a brewery. They, they make their own beer. Um, they also roast their own coffee. They in, work with some vineyards on some natural wine products. So beer and wine can be sold to go, but there, there's, you, you can't buy a bottle of vodka um, and, and walk out the door. There's no, no intent to do that. Um, they're not gonna get the license to do that. They don't have candidly space in the store really to even put any more than, more bottles of stuff than is already there. So it's, and I hope you know why I asked that question. Oh, because completely. you know the area and yeah. the challenges that we have and yep. face underneath the interstate and a lot of things that are going on. So I just wanna, you know, well, uh, make sure we're clear on that. I think the owners are very, very mindful of that. We, they operate in a very different way than, than Royal Market, for example, is down the road. I mean, this is a, this is, it's, a, it's a family place. It's a great place to, to enjoy coffee. There's a lot of great non-alcoholic options. Uh, given the, this new type of wet zoning they're gonna have, they can't sell more than, than you know, 51 or 49 percent of their, their revenue with you know, non-alcoholic beverage and food. So they're, they're, they're very familiar with that restriction and are, are going to abide by that. Question, Mr. Hudson. Please, thank you. Recommend. Uh, Todd, excuse me, Mr. Hudson. Please run that by me again. You're asking for a package sales off-premises consumption, but you just said you're not going to be using it for that. Yeah, there's no. You need a. I believe it's an APS license. We, we don't have. We have a two COP from the state, which is the two two beer and wine COP consumption. Um, on premises, we'd be changing that to get a four COP for a special restaurant. When again, that that has the limitation. That's just. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. That's yeah. just for sale of alcohol, liquor, hard liquor Correct. on premises. Correct. Then again, we why? Would, uh, then again, why are you asking for off premise sales? Because we do sell beer and wine for off premises. That was part of the original approval. So there's there's not a way that I'm aware of to in the local wet zoning carve out liquor off premises. We'd have to get a state license to do that. And I can tell you on the record and the owners will tell you there's no intent to do that. Um, but they're in the package sales for beer and beer, wine and liquor. That's somewhat inseparable what's within that. But so the, the intent, there, there's no intent uh, again, or ability to, to make this a liquor store because there's no state license. We don't have a state license and we're not gonna apply for one to have that liquor off premises. But beer and wine, that is being sold off premises. Well, you're now. The, the, the applicants are selling their own growlers, so to speak? They don't sell growlers. I'm going to ask Well, you excuse me, they're all, they're all brewed beer. Yeah, exactly. They're brewed, and, and they, they do resell um, a very small amount. I mean, it's the shelf area is no wider than this podium here for some natural wine products. But you go in there, it's, it's mostly coffee and cool t shirts. I, I get it. I, I'm just. Confused on why you're asking for a, a off-premises package sales. Again, uh, the decisions we make here go with the property. Mm -hmm. And I, I I don't want to see something in the future. I have the same concerns as, as Councilman Goods does. Sure. One thing I'd note, just Council, uh, uh, regarding it staying with the property, that, that that's correct. This does. However, if there's a suspension or a, a cessation of alcohol sales, for 60 days, and that, that probably is the type of thing that would happen if this business starts to go under. And then we worry about who's gonna come in next. If there's a 60 day cessation in alcohol sales, that special use permit goes away. So I, this company is committed to the neighborhood. Um, change, adding liquor sales is not an, an easy thing. I think this council knows that. I certainly know that and advise them of that. But the fact that they've got the support of the Tampa Heights Civic Association, neighbors that live literally across the street, 
is a testament to what a great neighbor they've been. Um, it's a testament to the, the amount of trust they've earned in the last four years since they got the first wet zoning approval in, in April 2018. This is something the neighborhood wants. Um, and I think they've demonstrated they can, can be responsible, uh, especially use permittees. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anyone else? All right, anyone to speak on the side? Okay. For the record, my name is Ruben Bryant. I'm a resident at 515 East Florida Raska Avenue. So I take it you are familiar with the address. I'm the homeowner on the corner where all the cars used to crash. <coughs> Uh, I'm the one that worked with the city of Tampa to get the light on the corner because all the cars were in my front yard. Um, as far as King State is concerned, they have been an incredibly responsible uh, commercial neighbor uh, from keeping the property clean to keeping it quiet to bringing a great vibe to the neighborhood. I'm not sure if you've ever had a chance to frequent any of you, but I have. And the concerns you have as far as the license being associated with the property, as far as liquor is concerned, uh, I'm for it. I live right across the street. So I have probably uh, the most to gain or lose if things go south as far as that is concerned because I'm, I'm their closest neighbor. Um, they've been nothing but responsible. And I wanted to come to, I saw a sign out front as it relates to something with city council as I drove, you know, walked past the house. So I ran and read it and noticed that this was on the agenda tonight. So I made a point to make sure I came to hear what they were talking about and I'm, I'm glad I did because again they've been great uh, from the very beginning so now it's been about four years uh, they've transformed that that corner uh, so instead of it being a former gas station or yet another auto repair shop because as you know there's quite a number on Florida Nebraska I'm sorry on Florida Avenue um, to change that into a neighborhood spot where people spend a ton of time I can attest to that because a ton of cars in the parking lot all the time. Um, and it's a great vibe to just be able to go across the street and, and enjoy a glass of wine or, or, or a craft beer and to be able to have a mixed drink there too as well. I think it's fine. Um, without, if somebody just looks on paper and sees that within you know a few blocks this way, a few blocks this way, there's another store that has alcohol consumption available to be taken off site, um, one might just come to a conclusion that is not really a reflection of what actually goes on and the differences between those stores and King State. Uh, this, like they said, um, I've been there, I've seen kids there, I've seen you know, families or friends just hanging out and enjoying themselves. But the vibe of that crowd is so great for the neighborhood. And so if you haven't had a chance yourself to go, pick any random time and check it out yourself and it'll help you get an idea of why they're asking for what they're as asking for. These guys didn't know I was coming tonight. I just literally saw the sign and then um, told them, I happen to have the number of Tim, who, who's because he's across the street, and uh, said, hey, I heard that you guys are having here tonight. Um, where is it again? What time is it again? Um, and then just decided to pop by just to make sure that you can hear from the community. Uh, I remember when they first came, uh oh, is that for me? I'll give you 30 seconds. Yeah. Okay. I remember when they first came to the community, uh, the first night, uh, there were a lot of people in, in favor of it, and probably about five people who were uh, against it. And the few that were against it, it was simply because they didn't know. They also hadn't been to another local place called uh, Lee's Grocery, which is right off of Central. And I asked them, have you ever been there, and have you ever felt that, that, that crowd, that vibe? I said, it's a bunch of nice people just hang out and join themselves after, after work. And I go, King State is going to be the same thing. And I knew that in advance just by what they were telling me they were, they were selling and everything else. So anyway, I hope you, um, if you need more information, 813-300-5900. Okay? Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for coming by and waiting. <laughs> and we'll speak on the side. All right, anyone ready to speak on the side? No rights to speakers for this item. We'll call by Mr. Miranda, second by Mr. Scalco. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. Uh, Mr. Carlson, number eight. Sure, I'd like to move file number 
AB 2-22-05, ordinance being presented for first reading consideration, ordinance approving a special use permit uh, S2 for alcoholic beverage sales, small venue consumption on premises, and package sales off premises consumption and making lawful the sale of beverages, regardless of alcoholic content, beer, wine, and liquor on that certain lot, plot, or track of land located at 520 East Florabraska Avenue, Tampa, Florida, as more particularly described in Section 3, providing that all ordinance or parts of ordinance in conflict are repealed, repealing <coughs> ordinance number 2018-48, providing effective date. Second by Ms. Miranda, roll call. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Cedro? Yes. And goes. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on April 21st, 2022 at 9.30 a.m. Madam Clerk, show Mr. Vieira so Mr. Mr. Shelley won't uh, shake his head there so, so we can we just, see him on screen. We just need him up on the, on he, the, on the video. He is on screen. He is on screen, but there I don't is. know how we could, there we could, no. You got him on screen, right? Yeah, there he is right there. All right, well, okay. the clerk, if the clerk tells us she got on screen, we got it. Well, right. there's, there's a screen that, that she has with the monitor, and then there's the, what goes out in, on the video. Gotcha. Yeah. Number nine. Thanks so much, Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. Agenda item number nine, case AB2-22-08. This is a request for a special use two uh, for a large venue, beer, wine, and liquor consumption on-premises and package sales off-premises consumption at the location 203 North Meridian Avenue. Can I please have uh, control of the screen? You have control, Zane. Can you see my screen now? Just blow it up for us, Zane. Wonderful. The applicant and representative is David Singer and Colin Rice. Now, this is a proposed uh, proposed AB sales permit. They currently have an AB sales permit there, AB 119-34. This is for a restaurant, beer, wine, and liquor consumption on premises only. So the addition here is uh, adding for asking for a large venue, and is also asking for packet sales off premises consumption. Now, the square footage for AB sales will not change. It will still, still be 3,806 square feet indoors and 1,165 square feet outdoors for a total AB sales area of 4,971 square feet. This being in the Channel District, um, parking is not required, and the sales hours will be consistent with Chapter 14. No waivers are being requested here, and there are no AB sales establishments within 250 feet. If you see the uh, parcel here, you'll see outlined in red. The overall uh, structure is the slade, and the parcel that's asking for the AB sales uh, permit is Lala Sangria. North Meridian Avenue runs up and down north and south to the west. Also, you'll have downtown to the west. The Channel District runs north and south here to the east. You'll have uh, North 11th Street. You'll have East Candy Boulevard to the north. You'll have um, Sparkman Wharf down there to the south. Pedestrian access to the site, as I'll show you the site right here. Pedestrian access to the site is on Meridian Avenue and also East Washington Street. If you see the subject parcel right here, already existing, part of the Slate Apartment Complex. If you see the elevations of the existing structure, as I went out to the site, you have a good shot of Lola Sangria Sangria Bar uh, right here, and the site also from the street of uh, East Washington. To the north of the site, you'll have the Slade, and they also have a couple uh, boutique uh, retail stores. And the west, you'll see downtown Tampa, and also you'll see the intersection of Meridian and East Washington. To the south, you have construction happening at this time and also the Channel District, which runs into more residential multifamily structures. 
uh, another AB sales establishment down the street, Parks and Rec, and also um, Sparkman Wharf down on the town district. To the southeast of the site, you'll see more residential multifamily. You have a high, ra high rise and also residential multifamily up and down southeast of the site on Washington. The development review and compliance staff has reviewed the application and finds this consistent with applicable city of Tampa code ordinances. Now, minor corrections are needed to the site plan between some first and second reading, and uh, staff will make sure that has been done. Thank you. Here for any questions. Any questions, Zane? All right, me and Mel, we have an applicant. Good evening, Council. Uh, Colin Rice here for the applicant, uh, 101 East Kennedy, Suite 2800. Uh, the property owner applicant being UDR Slade LLC, the establishment as Zane had mentioned, is Lala Singria. We have John English present with us. He's the owner of Lala Singria. Um, so I just, I'll be brief tonight. I know we're last on the agenda. I uh, have some simple visuals, and I'll kind of run through what we're doing here and be happy to answer any questions. So, and I appreciate, um, you know, I, the staff is overwhelmed. I appreciate their time and attention to this application. Uh, as Zane had mentioned, we're seeking a special use to for restaurant, large venue, beer, wine, and liquor consumption on premises, package sales for off premises consumption. It is currently operating under an S1 alcohol permit. To orient you here in Channel Side, we're at the edge of Channel Side. You can see um, Meridian separated by um, the, the median. We've got CSX rail lines across the street, so it's a pretty significant separation from the next adjacent development to the west. To the south, we have vacant commercial. Um, to the east, there is a surface parking lot here. Um, so development is happening, but, but currently it's kind of sitting uh, relatively isolated in terms of the channel district context. Uh, just to show you the elevation, this is facing to the northeast uh, on Washington and Meridian. I'm sorry for the, the busy floor plan here, but just to show you the, the layout that we're, we're looking at here. No, nothing physically is changing. This is identical uh, indoor and outdoor square footage. Um, want to let you know, uh, I know noise has been discussed quite a lot recently with city council. Uh, noise has not been a, a problem with this site. You know, we're, we're cognizant of the, the current ordinance, any changes that may come, and, and there has not been, we don't anticipate any problems um, dealing with noise. Uh, we're trying to be good neighbors, understand that this shares a structure with a large multifamily residential complex. Uh, again, has not been a problem. We don't foresee it being a problem. I'll note that the outdoor area faces the CSX rail lines as well, so there's nothing across the way that has been a concern. And just the floor plan again showing um, indoor, outdoor, overall. Uh, again, this is the Slate apartment development. Um, to provide a little bit of context here, our, our client took over this space very end of 19. You get into 2020 and into 2021, so he's seen the, uh, you know, the initial opening, entry into the, our, our new COVID world, our new reemergence. And the bottom line is the, the demands of the market and the business model. Um, the 51% food sales requirement uh, inherent with a special use one special restaurant approval. It's just infeasible for the site for this business model. That's really why we're here tonight. Um, we're on a parallel track working with the state. They have no issues with this. And really the idea is bring this into compliance um, for what they have experienced, what they see going forward so that this can flourish as a business uh, and restaurant in this community. Full kitchen, food available at all times. It's still functioning as a restaurant. Uh, it's been successful. We just want to recognize the experiences we've had in, in going forward um, with the correct designation here. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Appreciate your time this evening. Any questions for the gentleman? All right. You want to speak on this item? You want to register for this item? No rights to speakers for this item. We'll call on Mr. Scout. Right, you Take Thank you, Mr. Moran. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. All right. Is your
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have an ordinance being presented for first reading consideration. An ordinance approving a special use permit S2 for alcoholic beverage sales, large venue consumption on premises, and package sales, off premises consumption, and making lawful sale of beverages regardless of alcoholic content, beer, wine, and liquor, on that certain lot, plot, or tract of land located at 203 North Meridian Avenue, Tampa, Florida. <clears throat> As more particularly described in Section 3. Provided that all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict or repeal repealing AB 1-19-34, providing effective date, and with the uh, minor changes between first and second reading, um, this was found consistent. I didn't see any issues. Uh, and that's it. Second. Second one, Mr. Carlson. Roll call. Carlson. Yes. Maniscalco. Yes. Vieira. Vieira? Yes. Yeah. Cedro? Y yes. Can you hear me? Yes, Can got it. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Cedro? <laughs> no. Miranda? Yes. And Goods? Yes. Motion carry with Cedro voting no. Second reading and adoption will be held on April 21st, 2022 at 9.30 a.m. All right. Mr. Shelby. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, you had uh, asked uh, me, um, a Council, uh, when uh, the workshop was canceled, this morning's workshop, to come up with all the dates with the um, facilitator. Um, her, her best date uh, with alternates was, uh, was April 19th, and in, in talking with Council members, there are two Council members who won't be able to make the full meeting on the 19th. So, Council, um, Mr. Chairman, if you can, um, we can um, uh, have work it out with the facilitator, find out when those dates are available, and we could do that when the day the uh, new council member takes when, this When's the new council person supposed to be? April 7th. April, April 7th. 7th. The public, the public is, is still asking about this and calling about this. They have several calls a day, so I understand council members have schedules, but we have to get a date to get this done because the community is asking about it, so council members are going to have to adjust their schedules on somehow to, so we can get this done. We just can't keep putting off, putting off, but we can put it off until we get the new person to have seven people to do a vote of what we're going to do, yeah. but uh, I get it back as soon as I can. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to work with um, um, with the clerk's office and with your legislative aide to make sure that if the, if there's another board that is holding the meeting, holding the room, but it's not going to have an agenda, then we can take it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be on a Tuesday. I mean, I do have other options that you may want to consider. Um, May 10th is a special call, uh, is a meeting that you set for your commendations. You'll be here on May 10th, and the only thing right now on May 10th, if you hold any other commendations, if you don't put any others on for May 10th, the only thing you'd have on May 10th, if we can get it in April, that would be even better, but I know that everybody would meet. Then you could start your, let's say, workshop at 9.30, go to 12.30, and then be done with it. But, but, but I don't think... I, I don't know why we have this 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 gap stuff. My understanding was yes. we were having a special call workshop or a workshop yes. to discuss issues of the charter. That doesn't mean it would have stopped at twelve o'clock. It, it meant it was a day to whatever time we finished. If it ran into the afternoon, we finished. But that was my understanding. What oh. I, what I was thinking was I don't think just having two hours, two or three hours is three going to is oh. going to be able to hit some of the points we're trying to make. Well, then I'm going to have to talk to the facilitator because my understanding was it was a nine to twelve workshop. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. No, I, no, I, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm wrong. I'll we'll, we'll go around no, no. on that, but maybe I I misunderstood. You wanted I, a whole day. That's what I thought it was. I thought it was was just not just a couple of hours because I think we've got about three or four issues to discuss, and I already know how. How we go around a couple hours it's going to take that up real quick. But the, the consultant is a separate issue. Can 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 I make a motion to put it on May tenth? Um, may I, sir? Um, Mr. Mr. Vieira. Thank you. I, I I'm looking at my calendar on May tenth. Um, sorry, I got to get it back up. Um, I have a, a mediation where I'm serving as mediator at 1.30 that day in Lakeland, which would necessitate my leaving here to be safe there at about 12. So uh, unfortunately, I can't do, I can, I have that set aside for um, the commendation meeting, but unfortunately I couldn't stay for the whole meeting. So I request it uh, just to be done another day if at all possible. Well, the first thing, Mr. Chairman, we then would have to then resolve would be the facilitator because uh, uh, my understanding, and maybe I misunderstood, was that it, it was going to be 
um, uh, a morning workshop because you do have a night meeting that night as well. So well, in a worst case scenario, we can do it without a facilitator, but we need to find a date that we can all make. <laughs> okay, it. and that's. I mean, what what about May nineteenth? It looks like we only have one. May nineteenth is um, that's that's also late. I'd rather do it early if we could. Um, May nineteenth is a, a regular session. So you're going to have a full consent doc at the second reading. You can't. You, we got. It, it, unless we say now that we're not going to do that, then. But okay. Well, why, don't, why don't we take it offline and then we'll. If we could take it offline, I'll I'll, I'll work with the chair to 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 to, um, to work this out, and then we can. We definitely chair. should not do it later than May. Exactly. I mean, we got, we got, we got to come up with the date because the public's been asking, especially right. with something that happens. Did you want, did you, did you want to, uh, to be able to speed this along? Did you want to wait till the other council member? Because we'd want to have that, the new council member there. But, I mean, I could bring this back for next, work with you and bring this back for next week, or you want it on for the, for the seventh for the new yeah, council members here? And, the person will be here and then we'll have to choose the date, but we'll see if we can get it. All right. If that's what we wish, I don't have an issue. I just don't want it. Be kicking, 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 kicking. We need to go ahead and just open the can. I apologize, but I understand exactly what you're saying. <laughs> I do. Okay. All right. You walking up to Shelby, and we'll, we'll we'll do what we need. So, could we? Add, did you want to? Do you want? Do you want on the agenda for the May seven? Uh, excuse me, the April seventh discussion on the staff reports, like the last item, or just, that'll, that'll, just that'll bring it back. Fine. That'll I'm be fine. Note for April seventh on the staff reports, the last item on the agenda. To set to set to set the date for the charter discussion, yes, the charter workshop. Yes, sir. All right. You want a motion on that? What you want? Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Mayor's calculus made a motion. You a second? Second. Take Mr. Cross. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah. All right, Mr. Vieira. Nothing, uh -huh. sir. What? <laughs> Whoa! It's amazing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the miracle. Uh, Mr. Carlson. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mr. Carlson. Yeah, I have, I have three that I've kind of sketched out in the last few hours, so apologies, and if you guys don't like these, just tell me. Uh, but um, number one is I saw the stories about this um, new park in Channel District, and I was disappointed that the chair of the CRA was not quoted in the stories. And, um, and, it, and although the CRA was mentioned, it looked like it was a city project instead of a CRA project. And although this is maybe a CRA issue, I would like to <clears throat> make a motion to request that the CRA chair take the lead in city media announcements regarding city projects funded by the CRA. I'll second, I'll second that. As chair, I'll second it. All right. That's a set, but that's the sentiment of city council, I guess. It's, yeah, because, because the problem is that if, we're, if the money from CRA is being used to enhance a city facility, then the CRA is left out. But, and, and it's still CRA money. And so the CRA, if, if we're going to justify to the public that we need CRAs, we need to explain that the CRA it, is contributing. It, it goes back to what I've said originally, communication. The house next door has done tons and tons of people that does communications and defend the mayor on, on any issues, which that's what they do because those are her people. But this council has no one to defend them or to be able to ask questions to or anything at any time. You know, and that's the problem. So uh, when there is an issue like this here, they contact the city No one contacted Mr. Cedro. So really, we should have a person that be able to be contacted, be able to make statements, do whatever. And I've said this time and time again, the city is getting bigger, it's growing, and some of this council needs to think about because with all the issues going on, that has been going on, there's no one to speak for this council. There's no one. And I've said it time and time again. We're not going to be a smaller city. We're going to be a huge city with a lot of different issues. And most major cities, when you look at I've, I've been doing research, they have their own, per se, staff that handles their business. In, in the meantime, I talked to the chief of staff a couple days ago, and he committed to uh, try to work with us on these things. So uh, not this specifically, but just on better communication. So. Um, Motion on the floor by Mayor Scalco, second by Mr. Uh, I mean, Carlson. No, no, oh, Mr. Carlson, sorry. <laughs> you don't want to take blame for that. <laughs> yeah, this is something I, I've count, if you want to do it as a city council, but this is really a, a, a it's not a CRA issue. It is because there, we're sitting as a city council. That's correct. And the problem is that when the CRA, if we request it by the CRA, it has no I influence over the city. So we're asking the city communication department to to invite the CRA chair as a 
as a key spokesperson. The CEO, I, I'm not going to ask him, but I bet he wasn't invited. <laughs> and so uh, it's that that's it's. I mean, you would if you if you were doing if the city was partnering with the Tampa Housing Authority, the head of the Tampa Housing Authority be a, a, invited. Why isn't the CRA yeah. chair invited? Yeah. So. So you're expressing the sentiment of the Tampa City Council is what you're yes, doing. Yes, to request that the CRA chair take the lead in city media announcements regarding city projects funded by the CRA. All right. Motion by Mr. Carl. Second by Mr. Zitro. Please don't pour salt on the wound. <laughs> Zitro, all in favor? Uh, aye. Any uh, motion grant? Uh, second one, similar, and again, tell me if you all don't like this. Uh, the Business Journal hit with another story today. I have to read this to you all. I'm sorry to, it's late, but... This is just, it's really bad. This is really bad for our community. It's, it talks about an appeal, and I won't discuss the appeal, but it says the appeal comes amid widespread criticism in the real estate community that Tampa City Council's handling of development votes is often unpredictable. Developers and investors pursue deals in cities with stable political leadership. This is, this is a political attack. They didn't quote who said this, and so I'll assume the reporter didn't make it up. But what they're doing is they're, 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 we know who the people are saying this. Um, uh, and and, and it, it is a political attack against this city council. But the problem is, you know, they can say whatever they want about city council members. And, you know, they've been very effective at criticizing us, obviously. But the problem with this is that they're implying that this city council is giving the development community in Tampa a bad reputation. It's not the city council that's doing it. It's these stories that are doing it. Because this comment is only only appears in the business journal in these stories, and so the how is it that developers nationally, investors nationally, would think that there's a problem with development in Tampa? It's because they're reading these stories, and so uh, in a normal communication environment, we would ask the communication department to go talk to them and set the record straight. Because by the way, it's not widespread criticism; it's a handful of people. Number two, it's not true because we approve. 98, 98, 90 percent of development. In fact, we're criticized for approving too many, and uh, and we do have stable political leadership. We're, the difference is that we're thoughtful, and there's a handful of people that are upset, and it's not right. So, here again, tell me if you don't like this, but I would make a motion to request that the communication department, city attorney, development department, and clerk's office meet to review the record of votes of this city council, and the development department present, uh, present that record to the real estate reporter and editors of the Tampa Bay Business Journal to correct the misrepresentations that have been made to them uh, regarding this council's support of development and to prevent harm to our great city's national reputation caused by these articles and representations. I, I'm not going there. I, I appreciate what you're saying. Yeah. But, they but, just won't write about it. Uh, let them write about what yeah. wrote about, about me. It comes off my head. keeps on going. But it's not, my point is that it's not, I, I respect that if you guys don't want to support yeah. it. My no. problem is that, is that there's, in, in, a, in a normal organization, the communication department would go correct this. This, it, it, what's happening is that the, these comments are being allowed to stand uh, because they hurt city council. We have about to and, finish, and, like I and, said. And, but the problem, the bigger problem is that it hurts our city's reputation. The national investors who read this are going to think that there's a problem in our city. And I think we need to correct it, and communication departments and, and development department are not correcting it. So my request is that they go correct the record. Not that they criticize anybody. It's not criticizing the reporter or the editors. It's, it's setting the record straight because no, only a handful of people are giving them this information. We need to correct it. So anyway, is there a second, or should we let it die? If, they don't, if you're right and you know, it, it's in your favor, they can just choose not to write about it and not correct anything. They can, but the difference is that if they believe that, this, that the mayor's office and the city council are not aligned, then it's easy to pick at city council. The problem is that who gets hurt in the meantime? The citizens of our community. Our community's reputation gets hurt, not us. They can kick us out if they want. They already kicked one of our colleagues out. They, what we need to do is make sure that we protect the reputation of our city. And these kinds of misrepresentation are hurting us. They're, they're complaining about it, claiming that it's hurting the reputation of our city, but but the way they're talking about it and misrepresenting is what's really hurting our city. So I'll leave it at that. I will drop the motion, but I would just request that uh, you know between the chief of staff, development office, and the communication department, please protect our city. You, I hope that you will protect city council, but please protect our city's reputation because these statements are not true and they hurt our city. I think there's a, a, a talk down the line 
on the role of the city's communications person, and that might be something that we can talk about during the charter about the role the, of the city's communications. You guys understand it, there's a thing called SEO, search engine optimization. I protect myself. No matter what it is, <laughs> physical or not physical, I take care of me. So the, the problem Don't is search, en search engine optimization. If developers Google Tampa development, these stories are going to pop up. And they're going to think that Tampa is not a good place to invest. And so forget how it affects us. It's going to hurt our city. It's going to hurt investment in our city. Um, the, the last one is, um, again, you guys can decide whether to accept it or not. I spent a lot of time talking to James Shaw, who studied our, our um, charter back when Ford and studied other cities. He said in, the, um, in Creative Loafing that, um, that other cities, especially Sarasota is a, is a close example, have a specific ordinance that uh, protects city council members uh, sued under Chapter 119. So I'll make a motion and see if you guys accept this or not. I would request that the city make a motion to request that the city attorney review the Sarasota ordinance and those of other cities in consultation with James Shaw to create an ordinance to require the city attorney's office to defend elected officials in, in the city who are sued under chapter 119. The city, uh, here, I'm not protecting anyone but myself. The city attorney's responsibility is responsible for taking care of all of us, providing that we follow the guidance of the city attorney. And I don't, that's, all, that's why I'm on any of that. I'm not going to go out and say I need help when I don't need help. If they tell me I got to do a certain thing and I disregard it, they're not going to represent me. I don't think they will. I don't think my own attorney is going to represent me. It, if I have an attorney or I have a doctor and I go to the doctor's office and tell me, here's what you got to do, Charlie, take this pill. And I say, no, no, no. What are you going to tell me? Get another doctor. It's the same thing. It's basically the same thing. I'm not it's arguing different. with you. I'm just saying it's the same thing. I don't need protection. I don't want protection. I follow the guidelines of wherever I'm at, whether I'm here, I'm in the state, or I'm in my own. I follow the guidelines specifically. End of story with me. I'm not after nobody, and if they want to come after me, here I am. I don't have to hide. The, the difference is, and if you guys don't want to pursue this, you don't have to. I think it makes sense because it, it also would protect the mayor. Uh, but um, uh, uh, the... Um, and by the way, if we approve this, it doesn't mean we've approved the ordinance. It just means we've approved. I've already asked Mr. Shelby if you're looking at already. But I, I met with the city attorney the other day, and and the question I asked, which wasn't answered, is what's the fine line? If any one of us accidentally deleted one text message, we're in violation of the rules. And so then, is the city attorney not going to protect us? How far? Uh, where's the where's the fine line? If 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 you meet with one lobbyist and the lobbyist doesn't register it, or if you it, you could make the smallest mistake, and they could say, "Oops, you broke the rule," and then it and then it looks arbitrary, and so it's a dangerous situation. Um, you know, I spent ten, twelve thousand dollars just responding to a subpoena, and uh, and didn't get reimbursed. So, uh, you know, it, it, any one of us could get sued, um, and it, it doesn't. It, it, not talking about the suit that just happened or a situation that happened, but any one of us could, and uh, right now there's no protection. May I, Mr. Chair? Or, or you recognize? Thank you very much. You know, I I would want to look into this more before um, voting on it myself. If maybe it gets brought up at a later time when I can uh, take a look at the issue in that line. Um, uh, again, I, I you know before going down this step, I I just want to do more investigation on this issue. Uh, so you know, just how would you suggest that be just, done, Mr. Vieira? How would you suggest that I'm be done? Sorry, what? How would you suggest that be done, sir? Just individually, just on my own, not, not as a body. I mean, on my own. In other words, before voting on this, uh, I like to consult with people on it, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to, you know, start something uh, uh, going that may be unnecessary or that may be necessary, then vote against it. Just I'm by happy to, my Mr. Chair, I'm happy to well, withdraw I, it and send it as an email. I think, and bring it up well, next time. I think I think we have a city council attorney, and that's his job is to look into those issues to give this discussion, you know, to give discussion on it. I mean, individually, we can still look, but I think that's his job to look and see what 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 others are doing and other cities are doing. Uh, and, and so that's my opinion, but I think uh, it's it's worth Mr. Shelby looking into. And you want to give individual discussion, Mr. Shelby can do that. Give individuals. Uh, uh, Time to look at whatever, but I think it's worth looking into, though, sir. 
Yes. And, and, Mr. and Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to let you know, and I think if, if with the approval of council, unless there's any objection, what I'm going to do is I'll reach out to the um, local government section of the Florida Bar and just pose the question to see what other municipalities and other local governments are doing with regard to that. How, just to see what kind of response I how, get. How about if I just put on the agenda, can you do it by next week or? By, I, I suspect next week? Give him a little time. Kind of, Give him a little time. When's the next? Sorry, I just threw it. April seventh is the April next. Regular He's meeting. coming back with information, you know. So I, I could I, could I make a motion to ask the city council attorney to come back to us on April seventh nah. to uh, give us his advice yeah. on whether we should at least investigate further. Right. And, and Mr. Chairman, just just also to follow up, I have been um, uh, um, doing research with regard to you know. Um, insurance carriers that do that sort of thing but the question is in this form of government you know uh, as opposed to a city manager it's kind of the I, I've just just only begun that discussion but if, if that's what council wishes that'll be fine I could do it individually if you like but I'm going to put out that word and see what kind of response I get from the local government section I think it's just my opinion uh, it's only me I, my thing is you're the city council attorney yes um, you see some of the things that have been happening, be it right, wrong, and different things do happen. Right. Times change. Mm -hmm. So I think just to, in, to look into uh, and bring back information, there's nothing wrong with giving right. council information. As a matter of fact, quite <laughs> some time ago, actually, um, I reached out to, um, to the risk manager for the city because ultimately this insurance would have to be processed through the administration or, and has certainly have to be budgeted if, if that were council's pleasure, if it were available. So um, um, when I did uh, send uh, the email to the response uh, to the um, to the risk manager, um, I got the response from Ms. Grimes uh, with the information, but it really didn't go much further than that. So I just want to. Uh, what we need to do is get a copy of the policy because the policy that takes effect after five hundred thousand should be the same thing that's applicable less than five hundred thousand. But can, can I just pass a simple motion to ask the city attorney? City Council Attorney to report back to us on May se or April 7th about yeah. his advice regarding whether or not we should propose an ordinance uh, to protect City Council under Chapter 119. And I also have um, uh, started contact. I haven't made contact though with the City Manager, excuse me, the City Attorney in Sarasota because I'm, I was aware of that as well with regard to some sort of ordinance or, or at least the discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. A motion on the floor by Mr. Carlson, second by uh, Mr. Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion granted. Nothing wrong with discussion. Just getting information. And All right, thanks. Sorry, sorry we can't talk about this stuff outside city council. Yeah, but this, where, this is where it's at. It's a discussion. You know, we're just asking for information. So. Anything else, sir? That's all. Thank all you. Right, guys. I'm good, thank you. All right, Mr. Citro. Well, thank you for me. I, uh, unfortunately, I sat next to Luis Vieira for one week, ah. and I've got three of them. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to make a motion to uh, present a combination to Atafa Hosang Baharki. He's a uh, very capable PE engineer three who officially retired from the City of Tampa's Mobility Department Second. on March 1st, 2022. Mr. Baharki is being honored for his outstanding achievement, distinction, and contributions, and his ability to ensure Tampa's five mo movable bridges, sea walls, and roadways are safe. He has served the city for 36 years, and I would like to make this combination to Mr. Baharki on Tuesday, April 12, 2022. All right, second by Mr. Mascalco. All in favor? All right. Any opposed? Motion again. Item number two, a motion for accommodation I would like to make a motion to present a combination recognition uh, April as the National Recognized Minority Cancer Awareness Month and the George Edgecombe Society for second. at Moffitt Cancer Center is hosting a second annual virtual event on April 28, 2022. That will highlight the advance of cancer and health disparities in research. All right, second by Ms. Mascal. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. Item number three, I would like to make a motion to present a combination to Ryan Manassi. Planning and Development Coordinator who will be leaving the city later this month to work what? in the private sector. Ryan has taught us, a, he was taught by the best, in my opinion, Gloria wow. Moreno, and he's done a wonderful job. We will miss him. I would like to present this combination wow. to Mr. Manassi on Tuesday, April 12, 2022. Wow. Second by Mr. Manassi. No, Citro. Citro. Mr. Citro. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. Wow, that's, that's a loss there, man. Yep. Anything, sir? Yes, sir. I got it. Just go ahead. Uh, gentlemen, I'd like to make a motion to present uh, accommodation to the Tampa alumni Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated in celebration of their chapter's 75th anniversary presented at 
their uh, event on April 9th, 2022. Second. We have their, motion, uh, motion from Chairman Good. Second from, for who? Uh, Chair, uh, Councilman Miranda, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Their national organization will be here, or regional organization will be here uh, with, I think, their national president. And uh, for their first Amen. boat ride, or somebody turned to see red. So it's a uh, really good event. Second, I would like to make a motion request that the administration be requested to look into uh, an honorary renaming of Governor Street that runs in front of St. Peter Claver Catholic School to Yvonne D. Fort Second. Street in the honor of Yvonne D. Fort for 30 years of education and serves as a teacher that taught some of the of Tampa's brightest students in the B area. I right, the report uh, presented uh, before Council May 7th, 2022 on the staff reports. We have a motion from Chairman Goods. May 7th. My grandkids will too. Second from Councilman C. Troll in favor? Aye. All right. Move to receive and follow. Move receive and Second. It's time to adjourn. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, uh, good evening.